And there's the recently refurbished Constellation, a uh, great part of the United States Naval history and an attraction at the Inner Harbor in Baltimore, the beautiful downtown area, which uh, was filled with people again today. It was a hot, muggy day, but the city was filled with tourists. And uh, the ballpark is filled with baseball fans tonight as uh, interleague play continues. This interleague interlude with the New York Mets coming to Camden Yards for the first time in a couple of years. And the New York Mets, knowing that they can gain ground on the Atlanta Braves, who were defeated in an interleague matchup at the Sky Dome today. Three to two, the Blue Jays. Back of former National Leaguer Joey Hamilton got the win up there. This World Cup champion tribute from the baseball fans here at Camden Yards. Bobby Valentine has brought his Mets up here from St. Petersburg, Florida. They just finished a series with the Tampa Bay Devil Rays yesterday. In fact, we're defeated by the Devil Rays back of Wilson Alvarez, whom they might like to acquire as they are looking for a pitcher. Here's the Mets Pepsi batting order. It'll be Ricky Henderson in left field. Ricky is just uh, turned back the clock 10 or 12 years. I mean, he is looking rejuvenated. He's hitting well. He's stealing bases. Carlos Alfonso having a great year at second base, batting second. 31 RBIs in that 37-game stretch since they ended the eight-game losing streak. And that's hitting number two in the order. John Olerud, been in there every day at first base. Real solid. Mike Piazza, he's had 10 home runs in that 37-game stretch. He's catching. Robin Ventura, their RBI leader at third base. Brian McRae in center field, hitting sixth. Matt Franco is the designated hitter, and he's had a hot bat. Ray Ordonez, who has come back to earth a little bit after his hot June. And uh, Roger Cedeno, what a pickup for the Mets as he's leading the majors in steals, hitting 332. And uh, you, you just wonder, how could the Dodgers have let him go? And Cedeno, who has just been so outstanding and is the heir apparent to Ricky Henderson is, and has sort of been able to go to the Ricky Henderson School of Base Stealing. Tonight they'll all be facing Juan Guzman, tough right hander Joe. He's got good stuff. Well, he's been pitching better lately, John. He's lowered his earned run average almost two runs per game in his last five or six starts. But, I mean, the guy is capable of dominating any team he has a good fastball slider and a change I mean he has good stuff as you said and it's just a matter of which Guzman shows up tonight he often will struggle with the strike zone especially in the first couple of innings so we'll keep a close eye on that and let's take a little look at the defense behind him B.J. Serhoff in left field leads the league in assists with and he doesn't have an error this entire season so not only is he hitting well, he's playing great defense for the Orioles. You stand in it well. B.J. Serhoff going to become a, a team leader. He came here from Milwaukee. And not a whole lot of fanfare, but he's just always a solid player. But now he has become a, a different kind of a player, truly an all-star. He was in the all-star game because you, you just couldn't keep him off the team with the kind of year he has been having and he's become one of the, the best corner outfielders in the American League as well. And Ray Miller who has uh, been uh, the much beleaguered manager of the Orioles in his second year before the game Carl Overbeck after throwing out that first pitch went back to her true love and booted a souvenir up into the stands. Now Ricky Henderson and with Ricky Henderson don't look away for that first pitch because Ricky looking for a fastball right away to park in the stands at left field. He's done it more often than any player in history, as I'm sure you know. On the strike by Jim McKee in the outside corner. And John Ricky Henderson's closing in on a lot of milestones in his career. He has 2,057 runs scored, which is sixth on the all-time list, five behind the great Willie Mays. He also, oh, one strike. he also has 998 runs batted in, which, you know, a thousand RBIs is a big deal. You see the numbers? Close enough in on that all time walk record, too, isn't he? He's just a slider too low. Yeah, he's third all time in that, so he's, I mean, Ricky's just an unbelievably, un unbelievable leadoff man. And that's what he's done all the years. If you think of Ricky, you think of the steals, but he's an all round leadoff man. And there it goes, number 70.
76. He adds to his record. And that was a no doubt about it home run. Truly a big fly for Ricky Henderson, the 76th time in his career that he has as the first batter in the lineup led off the game with a home run. And that's 999 RBIs that he has now in his illustrious career. I mean, when you start to look at the things that he's accomplished, it's just amazing that he's still doing those things at his age. This is a fastball right in the middle of the plate, belt high, and Ricky knows what to do with it. The first pitch was a fastball away. He thought it was a ball, but it was called a strike. This one, he doesn't have any doubt about where it's going to end up. There's a strike to Edgardo Alfonso. Seventh home run of this season for Ricky Henderson. Look at that fastball right in the middle. Look at him. He knows, and here goes Ricky into his little ritual. <laughs> Slider in the dirt. Well, fine. So Ricky got a little flair. Yeah, he's got some flair. In fact, a few years ago, he had so much flair, they were throwing at him every time he hit a home run because they were upset with that. Into left center field. That's into the alleyway. And Alfonso will get extra bases. Brady Anderson picks it up. A double for Alfonso, his 25th double this year. And John, as I was saying, this is a very good ball club. I mean, that their first five hitters, first four hitters are 300 hitters. Alfonso, uh, let's see where this pitch is. Uh, that's not a bad pitch. That's just pretty good hitting right there. The ball was going down. It might have even been out of the strike zone, but he goes down and gets it and finds the gap in left center field. That was not the same type of mistake he made against Ricky Henderson. That was good hitting. Henderson and Benny Agbayani talking it over. That is called strike one to John Olderud, who of course played here at Camden Yards many, many times when he was the first baseman for the Toronto Blue Jays. Very particular hitter. Look at that on base average. 449. So you've got to keep it in the strike zone to make him swing at two ball or rather one ball and one strike. Well the Mets are a patient team I mean, they've drawn more walks than anyone in the National League. The Giants are second. The Mets have drawn 420 walks. So I mean they're a team that will take you deep into the count. That's too low. Two balls in a strike now. But now's the time if you're the Mets to get to Juan Guzman. The first time through the lineup, the opposition has a collective 352 batting average. But once they've all batted one time, he seems to settle in. And he puts everybody into a, into a slump the rest of the way. Check swing. There's the changeup. And it goes to 3 and 1. Now, for instance, in his last start after three batters against the Phillies, two runs on the board. And the Phillies never scored again against him. But that was enough to beat him. He left trailing 2 to 1 and got the loss. But again, now's the time to get to Guzman, and the Mets have one on the board, and they'd like to get Alfonso home. He's at second with nobody out. Three and one. Piazza is on deck as Olderud stands in. And he walks. Ray Miller, he's seen this before. Piazza, two three-run homers last weekend against the Yankees. He's a seven-time All-Star. As Charles Johnson is out to talk to Guzman. And I think what Charles was telling him, you made a mistake on Ricky Henderson. He hit the ball out of the ballpark. That was on you. You threw a good pitch to Alfonso. He got a base hit. So that's not on you, but walking Olerud is. Well, we're talking about the two homers he had against the Yankees, and here they are at Shea Stadium last week. Both of them three-run shots. That one was the tape measure deal. And he saluted the crowd afterward. That slider called a strike, and Piazza seems to be uh, somewhat shocked by that call. Well, since Ricky Henderson hit the fastball, he's thrown everyone a diet, steady diet of sliders. And he walked Olerud with sliders, and now he starts Piazza off with one. Two men on, nobody out. One run is already in. Mike Piazza. And Joe, I saw something today that was pretty interesting. There's seven players in Major League history who have at least 200 home runs and a career batting average of 330 or higher. Six of them are in the Hall of Fame, and Piazza is the seventh. Yeah. Pretty rare combination. On the inside corner, strike two. Well, 
Well, so far, the Mets are still adjusting to Jim McKean's strike zone because Piazza thinks that both of those pitches were off the plate. Ricky thought the first pitch was off the plate. And watch Piazza's reaction, forgetting what the call is or whether it's a strike or not. You see, he thought it was a ball. Grimace there afterward. From here, it looked like a pretty good pitch. He goes right back there again, and uh, no. One or two. <laughs> well, maybe that one was low. Babe Ruth, Rogers Hornsby, Ted Williams, Lou Gehrig, Al Simmons, Stan Musial, the other six guys who hit 330 or better for their careers and over 200 homers. And Piazza is there now. I've heard of those guys. I think uh, they're on that same list of 100 guys with you. Yeah, I let them get on the list with me. <laughs> that was another slider away from Guzman, and Piazza just fouled it off. Pretty uh, moving tribute the other night at Fenway Park, the All-Star game. I think it was moving at home. You should have been standing up there. <laughs> it was very difficult. One and two the count. And high and foul deep down the right field line with a soaring majestic drive here at Camden Yards. And it's a souvenir. It was uh, way late in that fastball. That's the look out there. You see the standing room area here at Camden Yards above the 25 foot high scoreboard in right field. They sell standing room tickets. Nice spot, Joe. You have a little shelf to put your drink on. <laughs> Rest your elbows up there. Yeah, but it's a long time to stand there. <laughs> so he's he's relaxed. They're, he's leaning. That's that's the standing room. That's not if you're one of the 100 greatest players of the century. <laughs> That's the aerial view from our gum out aerial cam. Beautiful Camden Yards. Downtown Baltimore. Mike Piazza with a run in. Two men on. Two and two the count. Struck him out. Well, that pitch fooled him, and you can tell it fooled him by the bat speed. Only 77 miles an hour. He was not prepared for that pitch. It was a breaking ball, a slider away. He tried to slow his bat down to make contact, and he couldn't do it. Watch this. It's not that tough a pitch. Look at that. It doesn't break that much, but you can see that he was fooled. He thought it was a fastball originally, and then he tried to slow his bat speed down, and he couldn't do that. Well, that's, uh, you talk about it often. He'd thrown that fastball away. Right. Piazza was laid on it. Then he comes back with the off-speed pitch. Robin Ventura, the Mets RBI leader, base hit on the first pitch. Albert Bell comes up throwing, and Alfonso held at third base by Cookie Rojas. With just the one out, he was held. So Ventura, on the first pitch, gets a base hit. I'm still a little amazed that you can't score on this ball because it's it's always a base hit. It's a ground ball. It's not a line drive. You don't have to wait. I mean, Alfonso comes around third, and they do hold him up. I actually think he could have scored on that ball. Here is Brian McRae. I thought so. Yeah. McRae. Had a hard time getting it going this year, hitting only 232, eight homers, 31 battered in. But there's a, a familiarity level for McCray, unlike some of his teammates, because he was a longtime American leaguer. So he's in there. Base is loaded. The Orioles, other than third baseman Ryan uh, Miner, are. I wanted to say Cal Ripken. <laughs> yeah. Well, that would. <laughs> This normally that's what you would say in this situation. So you don't even have to think about it. And uh, Miner is the only one who's pulled in on the infield. The rest of the infielders are looking for the double play ball. McCray, even when he was in this league, did not do much against Guzman. Four hits in 29 career at bats against him, which is you know, all the more reason why maybe they should have sent Alfonso there. Right. Well, you can see one thing. Well, they're going to get a visit. Guzman's going to get a visit, and I think I know why. That was an off-speed pitch, as we see Olerud and Ventura at first. As you mentioned, that Alfonso over third. Another off-speed pitch. It's like he's afraid to use his fastball, and you you have to use your fastball because if you get behind with the other pitches, you're going to have to throw the fastball anyway. And after throwing, getting behind McGray with the bases loaded on an off-speed pitch, Bruce Keeson said, I've seen enough, so he goes out and talks to him.
Ricky Bonus is already up in the Oriole bullpen. See, the problem now is McRae and everyone else in the ballpark knows you're going to throw him a fastball. You should have gone after him probably 1 0, is what Keeson is saying. From the windup. Too high with a fastball. 2 0. That's the 23rd pitch thrown in this inning by Guzman already. McRae has done a pretty good job. He laid off the first fastball, which was high, and he lays off that one as well. You just saw the count three and oh, not two and oh. Three balls and no strikes. Three men on. And he has walked in a run. So the first inning blues have struck Guzman again. Two runs in for the Mets. Now the question is whether it will only be the two runs. As the Mets have visions of four, five, six runs, they want to go for the jugular right here. And Matt Franco, very good hitter. Who is DHing tonight? He's their best pinch hitter, and he's the guy they would like to have up if you're at the bottom of the order in this situation. Matt Franco, he ordinarily the Mets in the National League games, they're great pinch hitter. That slider is called a strike, and it is on one. Now, Cal Ripken around the batting cage asked Mike Piazza before the game. He said, "Now, how come you, on a hot, humid night you didn't take advantage of the American League rule and DH tonight?" And kick back a little bit when you can. He said, Well, because Franco's been so hot. Little tap. Guzman gets one at home. Johnson to first. Two double play, and the side is retired. So the Mets get merely the two. A good start for them, but also an opportunity lost at the same time. Ricky Henderson goes deep to start it off. Orioles coming up. Ball presented by Gumma. The Mets with two on the board already. As we get again the spectacular look from high overhead Camden Yards here in Baltimore. Scott Erickson who won his fourth straight last night there walking by number 19. The Orioles Pepsi starting lineup now. Brady Anderson is in center field. Mike Bordick at shortstop. B.J. Surhoff seventh in the league in batting average. Just off his appearance at the All-Star game. Albert Bell in right field. Harold Baines at 40 years old. And uh, hitting 355, but since May the 12th, he's hitting 404. Will Clark also hitting over 300 at first base. Ryan Miner up out of the farm system replacing Cal tonight. It'll be Jerry Hairston Jr. at second base, and Charles Johnson, the catcher, hits ninth. And on the mound for the Mets, right hander from Japan, Masato Yoshi. And he is he's not overpowering, Joe. At this stage, he's probably closer to. The 40 year old Oral Hershiser than anybody else. Well, he throws sinkers, fork balls, sliders, and change ups. And it's imperative that he stay ahead of the hitters because they have to help him out. He has to get them to chase some pitches out of the strike zone. But like most guys who are not overpowering, you need to locate well. Brady Anderson is also adept at hitting that leadoff home run for the Orioles. He takes ball one. Brady, he's got 12 homers, 48 runs batted in. And also, like Ricky Henderson, adept at getting on base one way or the other. He's got a 416 on base average. Nice pitch over the outside. And John, when the, the opposition's leadoff hitter hits a home run, you go up there kind of thinking the same way. Do the same thing. Really? And Brady had 50 home runs three years ago, so he's capable. Brady Anderson, 1996, hit 50, which astounded the baseball world. But he's always he's a very strong guy. And you see, he's third on that list. Only Bobby Bonds and Ricky Henderson have let off more games with homers than Brady Anderson. And that is low. And he is very particular up there. He walked 66 times. And uh, for the first time, there's a lot of talk in Baltimore about even Brady Anderson, possibly. Being traded in the right kind of a deal. The Orioles are dead last in the East. And Anderson starts it off with a walk. Well, supposedly, John, there are only six players who are untouchables, of course. Cal Ripken, Lucina, Johnson, Ponson. I mean, they have very few guys that they won't trade, but they do have a few untouchables. Mike Bordick, the hitter. Well, when you're 39 and 51 and you have the oldest ball club in all of Major League Baseball and the highest payroll, or one of them, and 
at some point, I guess it, you're liable to start talking about, well, what's plan B? Yeah. Last year, they, they did not trade, although they had so many of those free agents. And they resisted trading the higher priced players, many of whom left the ball club, like Roberto Alamo, Rafael Palmero, and others for young young players. And maybe they, they might even have some regrets about that night. There are some young guys who might be able to help them now. Brady Anderson running into right field. The catch by Cedeno back to first, and Brady gets back in front of the throw. Good heads up base running there by Brady Anderson. Not to get doubled off as he was breaking for second base. Let's take a look at the defense. And this is an excellent defense, the best defense in the National League. And Edgardo has only made two errors this entire season, and this is his first year at second base. He was a third baseman in the past. Now he's over at second base, and he's playing very well. Yeah, Bobby Valentine talked about him as a, a gold glove quality third baseman. And it seems like there's been no breaking in time for him to go back to second base at all. I mean, he played some second base in the past. He played shortstop. And uh, the, the great thing is he's adjusted to a, a, a much different position. A lot different responsibilities at second base. Yeah. And it hasn't affected his hitting. His hitting is better than ever. It's second base is dip more difficult to play than third base because you know you're playing there you move into a position where you're sitting there with a guy coming at your back on the double play you have to make the double play and you're just not used to making that play when guys are coming from your blind side and Ventura of course a gold glove winner at third base in the American League and that's the reason Alfonso had to move B.J. Surhoff one ball one strike to count Surhoff had just gotten into some kind of a groove and I know Joe we talked to him a couple of weeks ago when we had that holiday telecast on ESPN at Yankee Stadium. And and you asked him what the difference was. Right. Because he's hitting more homers than ever, having a, a better RBI year than ever. And he says it, a lot of it has to do with maturity. And I, and I think that's exactly right. I mean, as a hitter, and especially a smart hitter, I mean, you learn your weaknesses. I don't think you become a good hitter until you know your weaknesses. Everyone says, well, you know, I'm a strong, I can hit the fastball well. Well, you have to know your weaknesses as well, and you stay away from your weaknesses. If you don't hit the low ball well, stay away from swinging at it. Swing at all high pitches, or vice versa. Surhoff has always been a, a strong hitter, professional hitter, but not a star hitter. Right. Now, this year, he has become a star. I mean, he's one of the best players in the game right now. There's Albert Bell on deck. I mean, Albert came over here. And he is third on his own team in RBIs. I think a lot of Serhoff's success has to do with Albert indirectly because Albert Bell's presence behind him does help him as a hitter. And Ray Miller has pointed that out several times, and, and I think there's a lot of merit to that. And maybe Albert didn't get enough credit for that. But right now here in Baltimore, it seems like the fans in general are not in a mood to give Albert credit for anything. Because well, they want to give him are, some credit. <laughs> maybe for negative Albert, credit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he's getting a lot of credit for things he'd rather not get credit for, maybe. Yeah. Although maybe he, he, he will be, he, he doesn't talk to us about it. Anderson got a great job, and he's heading for third. Ordonez could not knock that one down. It's a steal for Brady Anderson and an error on Piazza, the 21st steal of the year for Brady. And I still have a problem when you're a middle infielder. Your job is to keep that ball from going into center field. Serhoff had the base stolen easily. I mean, Brady Anderson had the base stolen easily. Even, now watch this. He's already at second base. So if you have to run up, run toward the catcher to knock the ball down. Don't just try to knock it down. Run toward the catcher and block it. You should never let a guy go to third base with one out in that situation. Deep in center. McCraven seemed like he saw it at first. Now he's back there very deep. The deepest part of the ballpark for that 410 marker. Anderson scores easily. Sacrifice fly for Serhoff. Two to one Mets. Meanwhile, we got a final from Seattle. Let's go to Bill Pito. All right, John, come out, takes us to Seattle. Safe go field. Russ Davis last night, the first homer in the history of the new ballpark. Tied against Arizona at seven, bottom ten. Davis the batter. Fair ball. John Mabry comes in to score. King Griffey Jr. homer to this one. Arizona goes down, Seattle wins at 8-7 and 10.
All right, Bill, thank you. And we are plugged into all of baseball tonight. There's several other Sunday night games as Albert Bell stands in. And a changeup from Yoshi and it is 0 1. Albert Bell with 19 homers, 57 battered in. Don't forget, he's had a history of monster post All Star portions of the season, including last year. He had 31 homers after the break last year. That's a base hit. Well, he's actually been swinging back much better lately. But the one thing he's not doing is supplying a lot of power, which they thought he would do. A lot of people thought he would, might even challenge the 60 home run mark here in this home run hitter's ballpark. Take a look at his swing. Ball is away, and he just reaches out, hits a line drive. He gets his hands back in good position right there and just kind of throws this one in the left center field. He doesn't try to overpower it. Albert at first, and if you don't keep a close eye on him, he's liable to steal. Harold Baines at the plate. 355 batting average. They got a shift on for Harold. Three infielders are to the right of second. This is a, the way you'll see it often in the National League for Bob, uh, Barry Bonds. The third baseman, Ventura, is almost over to shortstop. But you see in the outfield, they're playing him pretty much straight away. In fact, in center field, you've got Daniel, I mean, a little bit off toward left field. Ricky Henderson. And that's the way he did it, didn't he? Hit it in the air and hit it toward left field. That's the inning. The Orioles get a run. Two Mets as we go to the second from Baltimore. You look at Camden Yards, downtown Baltimore, and the old uh, B&O warehouse there, the, the railway station, from the gum out aerial can. Lunging at the first pitch, the off-speed delivery from Guzman is Ordonez, and he fouls it away. Ordonez, who got real hot there for a while, got his average up over 300, but he has fallen back to earth. Hitting below 200 here in the month of July. Ordonez, to be exact, hitting 188 so far in July. Two to one the score. The Mets on top start the second. Guzman. He's had that history of getting much better after the uh, the first inning or two. The slider kind of hung up there, and Ordonez lost one down the right field line in amongst the spectators. And a fan caught it. He brought his glove, and he made the catch. Bro. I think that will change his life. <laughs> Probably his first one. Look at him. He is the happiest guy in America right now. He's showing it to his buddies. Won't have to pay for dinner probably after the game. Two to Ordonez. Now that is the real good Guzman slider right there. It's been one of the best in the American League for a long time. I mean that slider, when he first came up, people thought it was a, a split finger pitch. But he doesn't really throw when he, he throws that slider, and it's it's devastating when it's right. Oh man, that looked pretty good on the inside. And the thing that you can see Guzman wanted it, but the thing that he does with the slider, he really gets on top of it, John. That's why it looks like a splitter sometimes. The reaction and watch Guzman's reaction as this pitch is called a ball off the plate inside. And the slider. Did he swing? No. First base umpire. Bill Miller ruling in favor of Ordonez there. Three and two the count. Well, the one thing already this inning, his slider is a lot sharper. It's breaking sharply. He was throwing, it was spinning more in the first inning. This one is really diving. play as well. And he even seems to have a better location with his fastball. Now he's able to hit this outside corner. That was a pretty good pitch as well. Three and two. Now there are three other games still going in the major leagues. We'll keep you plugged into all of those, including a real interesting series going in Texas starting tonight, an interleague series between two division leaders. We had that series in New York. The Braves and the Yankees, the two Eastern Division leaders in Major League Baseball. And tonight, the two Western Division leaders are head to head the San Francisco Giants and the Texas Rangers at the ballpark in Arlington. We'll update you on that one. The Dodgers are in Pittsburgh. Three and two. Right field. Albert Bell. Not number one. Big Wednesday night baseball doubleheader coming up.
In the first game at 7.30 Eastern, the Cardinals and the Reds. Big Mac, assuming his back heals up, will be back in town. Barry Larkin, Sean Casey, the surprising Reds. And the Athletics of the Mariners are from Safeco Field. John Jaha, Jr. and A-Rod. A lot of great stars in action on Wednesday Night Baseball on the doublehead of the first game, 7.30 Eastern. Don't miss it. Roger Cedeno, the switch hitter. Called, well, did he call it a strike or did he say he swung at it? One way or the other, it's 0-1. Junior hit his first home run safe go field today, I think. Number 30 overall. Took him, uh, I think it was the third game there before anybody home. Russ Davis was the first one. I have a theory about that ballpark, Joe. There's a swing and a miss, the slider 0 2. What is that theory? It's you know it's a bigger park. Yes. And there's some concern that all those sluggers won't hit as many homers. Right. But my theory is is that it, it will be such a great ballpark for their pitching staff. I mean, Jeff Fasero already pitched one of his best games of the year in his first game there. That there'll be a much better ball club there. Even though they may hit a little bit less in terms of the home runs. He was ruled to a bunted at that one. Strike three. Two down. Well, so Dan, I don't think Bobby Valentine is really happy with that. You're hitting 332 and you try to bunt with two strikes. I mean, if you're going to bunt, why not with one strike? I mean, but with two strikes, I don't actually, that's pretty good bluff. He, he thinks he took the bat back. But uh, maybe he left it out there too long. Up there from Max Cam being worn tonight by Charles Johnson. We appreciate it. Yes, yeah, off the outside there, though it was a, a real close one. Breaking ball. I mean, Ricky hit a fastball for a home run his first time up. Ricky Henderson. I mean, Ricky is a marvel. He's 40 years old. We got two guys who could be playing in old timer games by now. And they are both playing like stars <laughs> in the big leagues. Ricky Henderson and Harold Baines. Well, Guzman takes a walk, John, because he's very upset with that last pitch call because he thinks Ricky Henderson ducked under it. So he he raised his hands a little bit and then he walks behind the mound to calm down. Ricky has had that kind of effect on pitchers a lot because he does duck underneath some high fastballs. It's called a strike. Well, you know, Ricky, Ricky kind of works umpires too. I know a catcher told me years ago that Ricky started, you know, he was very friendly, like he's helping the umpire. The umpire called a strike on him in the first inning. Ricky turns and says, now see, that's a mistake a lot of guys make, but that's not a strike on me. It's a strike to a lot of guys, but not on me. My strike zone. Yeah, I've done a lot of guys try that, but maybe it works for Ricky. Because as you know, Ricky goes into that crouch, but his strike zone is supposed to be where his normal stance would be, not, you know, where he if, crouches down. You mean when he's hitting the ball? Yeah. If he crouches down, I mean, you can, if you were to bend over to waist all the way to your knees, you wouldn't have a strike zone. Well, I, I think he and Tony Phillips bend over like that, and, and it works for him. See that crouch there? Now, truthfully, this should be, well, I, I don't want to say where the strike zone is nowadays, but that one was definitely high. Well, that one was high, Juan. I think he agreed with that one, but I think that's Juan just a little upset yeah. himself, not getting it into the Ricky. Well, now Ricky, another walk to his toe. Wow, he has buried that fourth guy. I mean, look at that. I mean, he's also going to catch that first guy too. <laughs> that fourth guy is uh, eating Ricky's dust right now. I didn't even realize that uh... he passed you months ago. Yeah. But guess what? Sorry, Joe. That's, a, that's okay. With Four me. now in the hey, list. As the guys say, I just want to be amongst them. <laughs> <laughs> Man, you were amongst them on Tuesday night at Fenway right. Park. You're not the best there, but just be amongst them. Alfonso. Slider. Check swing. No swing, says Bill Miller on the appeal. 2-0 and the count to Edgardo, who doubled his first time. The Mets lead 2-1. to one. We're in the second inning. And Ricky Henderson's at first base. But... Seeing as how he's stolen more bases than any player in the history of Major League Baseball, maybe he won't stay there long. 27 steals this year, and he's 40. Foul 
quarterback can have a play. Well, he's the only guy in the history of the game have over a thousand steals. I mean, that's a thousand. I mean, you know what a thousand? I mean, that's a lot of steals. But he doesn't see. I mean, he's not. He wasn't very aggressive in his lead, taking his lead the last two pitches. I think he's serious about it now. He's going now. Well, if you don't stop him, see, a lot of times he he makes you stop him. That's a good throw there by Guzman. Lou Brock was like that. He walked off and he just continued to take little small steps or to lean. He made you stop him. You have to stop him, otherwise he gets a great jump because he's already moving. Two on one, the count. Ricky not running. High in the foul off the first base side. Into the crowd. Two balls, two strikes. I actually thought he was going to try to go there, but I, he mistimed Guzman's move to the plate. And Charles Johnson can be a deterrent to running. If you don't get a good jump, Charles Johnson is a pretty good chance to, to throw you out. And he's one of the best throwing catchers in the game. Well, this is what you like, good confrontation like this. is like a fastball pitcher to a fastball hitter, a base stealer to a, with a good throwing catcher. Ricky was upset because he didn't go then. There he goes. Got a breaking ball. Quick throw. Perfect. He got it. That's what we were talking about. I mean, you won't see a better throw this side of Ivan Rodriguez than that one. Charles Johnson in a vintage performance. Ricky Henderson gunned down. A classic confrontation. We'll be back. Ricky Henderson with a bad experience. He got thrown out trying to steal. The all-time leading base dealer in history gets gunned down. And the thing about it, it was a breaking ball. Here's Ricky. Now watch his right foot. Watch the right foot. A little hesitation there. He doesn't pick it up like a lot of guys. It's not a false step, but you can see he slides it back underneath him, which takes a little bit. You're supposed to just turn and pivot on it, but he gets a great jump. And watch, if this throw is not perfect, I mean, right there, he's out. And, you know, he may argue that he was safe anyway. I mean, he's safe if it throws offline just a little bit. Perfect throw from Charles Johnson. But as you mentioned, Charles is capable of doing that. He and Yvonne Rodriguez can stop the running game all by themselves. Two years ago, when he was with the Florida Marlins and they won the World Series, I mean, he was the National League's Yvonne Rodriguez. I mean, he was a weapon and intimidated many a base dealer in the National League. Well, one of the great confrontations that I've ever seen was between Charles Johnson and, and Lofton when Lofton was with uh, the Atlanta Braves that year. Yeah, yeah that he was the Braves in the postseason. And I mean, it was just beautiful to watch, but and a, and a great base deal. That's what I like about the game. I mean, people say that, you know, home runs are the thing, and it is a big part of the game, but I still, still think the little fundamental things are important. Will Clark, the hitter, 313 average. Alfonso. I mean, this Mets infield, if the pitcher, Yoshi, gets him to hit a ground ball, he should be in great shape all night long. Well, he threw a good pitch there, I mean, sinker. But that's what I was talking about before, about knowing yourself and knowing your weaknesses. Will Clark's a very good low ball hitter. So what that means is you can go out of the strike zone low. You just can't go out of the strike zone high. You won't see Will swinging high pitches out of the strike zone, but you may see, see him swinging a lot of low pitches because he hits the low pitch better. And that's a strength for Yoshi. He throws that great sinker. Here is Ryan Miner. Two years ago, he was the phenom of the Orioles' spring training camp and appeared to be a can't-miss prospect. But moving into Triple A that year, he did not have a very good year and went, really went down in their estimation. That changeup from Yoshi in there for a strike and get his own two. He's up here now because Cal Ripken got that deep bone bruise, and uh, they figured he might only have to fill in for Cal for a handful of days. I think the problem at Triple A was that problem right there, John, not being able to make contact. He had struck out 106 times already in Triple A. And, you know, if he makes contact, he seems like he's a pretty good hitter and with some power, but you have to make contact. And if you're not making a lot of contact at Triple A, you're certainly not going to make a lot of contact here in the big leagues. Here's a two strike pitch. I mean, pretty good pitches there from Yoshi. I mean, it wasn't like. He threw him down the middle and he couldn't handle him. He hit the outside corner with every pitch. Ryan Miner yeah, had not played all that much baseball. He was a basketball player and a good one. He's got a, a twin brother, Damon Miner, who's in the San Francisco Giants organization. He's a first baseman. And a left-handed hitter. Here is Jerry Hairston. We saw him a couple of weeks ago and we're very impressed with him. Pops this one up, shallow center. 
McRae. And that is the end. Three up, three down for Yoshi. It'll be Alfonso, Olerud, and Mike Piazza coming up for the Mets. The Mets lead the Orioles two to one. And Pirates, top of the ninth. Dodgers down one. They've won six of the last seven. And here, Eric Young, the base hit. Trinidad Hubbard comes in to score, ties the game up to five, and that's a score playing the bottom of the ninth. Sunday night baseball, the Mets two, the Orioles one. The Mets coming up in the third against Guzman. Edgardo Alfonso, who doubled and scored the second Mets run of the first, takes ball one. John Olerud and Mike Piazza will follow. There's a view from Mascam. That one is fouled back and uh, into the club level area. The second deck here at Camden Yards. One ball and one strike. Mascam being worn by Charles Johnson. And again, we, we really appreciate that. And, uh, the big league catchers will agree to wear that camera because I mean it puts you the our viewer I mean right down there right in the game such a, a great special kind of look at the action puts me down there too John I watch my monitor every once in a while me too see what we can learn me too except I don't know we don't count puts us down there Joe and who cares <laughs> two and one the count but it is it is fun to be right down there in the action. One thing, uh, you know, when you have a chance to get close to a big league pitcher when he's warming up, right? That one is hit high and deep into left center. Brady Anderson, that's the deep part of the ballpark. He's got it. Brady's got a little style when he makes a catch like that. That's the only trouble with showing mask up down every time the ball leaves. It looks like it's going out of the it's ballpark. Gone, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the sound right there sounded like it was gone. Listen to this sound. Oh, well. He, Boom. Yeah. <laughs> but it looked like it was going out of the ballpark. Now, if he was sliding, sliding into second, we have a mic there. Okay. We'll get some. But mask, it's mask cam, not mask mic. Okay. One day. We'll have a mic right in the back. Well, one one thing I want to bring up, John. You know, last time we were broadcasting here, you were not with us. Your daughter was graduating from high school, and you were making the speech. And I was just thinking, how soon they forget who you are here. Your daughter Holly's here tonight, and they gave her seats out in the bleachers. I mean, you were the you were the Orioles. You were the voice of the Orioles. You were the man. And they give her two <laughs> seats out in, in right field. That's amazing to me. I mean, how soon they forget. That's the view that they gave her. Right there. That's the view <laughs> they gave her. And that's your daughter. Uh, Where's the ticket guy? I don't know. I don't know, Joe. They, they showed me the door. and <laughs> Now it's... Just, yeah, for him, bleachers. Well, that's okay, but don't take it out on their daughter. Okay. Yeah. I was giving her a speech. I was giving her another speech, though. Oh, okay. <laughs> don't look a gift horse in the mouth is what I said. <laughs> Mike Piazza. If I ever have to go into a war or anything, though, I want you by my side. All right. Yeah, and you go first. <laughs> Mike Piazza. <laughs> Sticking up for my daughter. Yeah, you are one of the hundred best of all time, no question. Well, I have daughters too, so we have to take care of them. Strike one to Mike Piazza. And by the way, where'd you get that shirt? <laughs> <laughs> one of Joe's old ones. <laughs> now we we must coordinate a little better. We must tell each other what we're going to wear from now. Oh, if, if you're wearing the blue with the white collar, yeah, I'll wear something different. Yeah, we'll wear something different. On one the count. Piazza struck out his first time against Guzman. One ball, one strike. Two down, nobody on here. Guzman, true to form, a rough first inning. The Mets got two against him. But he got out of a bases loaded one out jam, minimizing the damage. And now he's showing signs of maybe settling in. And when he settles in, he's awfully tough. And there are a lot of rumors about teams that would. Maybe like to take Guzman off the Orioles' hands. And first and foremost is Texas. They think that, you know, he'd, he'd fit right in well there. 
because they figure they can get six innings out of them. They do have, you know, pretty good bullpen, although Wetland's been struggling a little bit lately. Too far in, two and two to Piazza. Hey, look, you just stopped by the booth here. Yeah. One of the uh, great Oriole former leadoff man. Now an instructor in the organization, Don Buford. Yeah. And his son, Damon, plays up in Boston. Yeah. It's like a civil war at the Buford house household <laughs> whenever Damon comes to town. Three and two now. There's Buford. There he is. He's, there he he is. still looks like he's at his playing weight. Yeah, he, he does. I, Buford, you're looking good, man. He hasn't grown any either, though. <laughs> 1969, when the Orioles won 109 games, Don Buford was the leadoff man, and he was the guy. He hit homers, walked over 100 times, hit around 300, did it all. He was the man who set up Frank Robinson and Brooks Robinson and Booth Powell. And let them get all the credit, right? That's right. They got yeah. all the glory. Yeah. And he was out there paving the way for him. In fact, R Ricky Henderson and Pete Rose are the only leadoff men that got their just due. Everybody else was kind of set up men for the middle guys. Three and two to Mike Piazza. Bobby Bonilla and John Franco on sitting with Ricky Henderson. On that slider, Piazza went down to get it. Base hit the left field. Well, that's the first slider that he's gotten inside to Piazza. The other ones were away. He struck him out on the slider away in the first inning. This one is in, and Piazza rips it to left field for a base hit. Now watch this pitch. Watch where it is. Inside part of the plate. Piazza with the two strike swing. Look at that good two strike swing. Goes down, gets it, and rips it in the hole. Robin Ventura called the strike. Ventura hit the first pitch he saw from Guzman for a single to right in the first inning. Two to one. The Mets lead the Orioles. We're in the third. This is sort of a typical Guzman outing in that he always throws a lot of pitches. He works. Very deliberately. Too far in. One ball, one strike. He was that way in Toronto. The thing that's really changed for Guzman over the years, when he started with the Blue Jays, he was almost unbeatable. Yes. I mean, at one time, his major league record was 39 wins and 13 losses. And it had not stayed that. Well, he's had some arm problems, and every time he thinks he's okay, he starts to pitching well, and then he'll have arm problems again. Look at that. There it is. He's 45 and 62 since that great start. Last year, he was 10 and 16. 3 and 6 the year before. And that changeup is too low. 3 and 1. He had one year in Toronto where he was 4 and 14. But his first three years, he was 10 and 3. 16 and 5 and 14 and 3. He has already thrown a hundred, uh, let's see, 67 pitches. I'm going to say 100 a little high there. You know? <laughs> I got a little carried away. Yeah. He'll be at 100 uh, before, before you know it. That's ball forward to Ventura. And a two out walk. Piazza takes second. And Guzman has already walked four hitters in this game. This all started with two down and nobody on. Piazza single to left. Here's Mookie Wilson, the Mookster. Talking to Robin Ventura, the first base coach for the Mets now. Brian McCray comes up. And you can see Ray Miller not pleased with what is happening with the number of pitches he's throwing and how he stays in jams here in the early going. Check swing and a foul off to the left into the Mets dugout. On one to McCray. By the way, I was talking to Roger Sedania before the game about whether or not he'd gone to the Ricky Henderson School of Base Dealing as long as he had the opportunity. And he said that Ricky had been very helpful and also Mookie Wilson. Because Mookie could steal a base. He said that the main thing they've been helpful with is finding little tip offs from pitchers about their move. On to the count. He says also that. He'll watch when Ricky gets on in the first inning. And he says, especially with the left hander. And how their pattern of going to first or going home. And he finds he finds it almost invariably it's been the same pattern. If he gets on base against that pitch. That misses for a ball. One and two. And of course.
course, he's hitting ninth. Ricky's hitting leadoff, so he gets a chance to really study when Ricky gets on base. Well, you can learn a lot by watching people who are very good at their craft. And Ricky Henderson is one of the best. So you can learn if you watch closely just how he sets the pitcher up or sets the catcher up to try to steal a bit. Two on, two out. And he misses inside. Two and two to McCray. Matt Franco would be next. Now Guzman has passed 70 pitches. We're only in the third inning. In that start in Philadelphia, he pitched well, gave up just two runs, but had, had to leave after six innings because he had thrown 125 pitches already. Piazza at second, Ventura at first, both better to go in anything. Albert Bell, and that's the end. Two left. And Sunday night baseball presented by Gum Out. Two to one, the Mets lead the Orioles. We go to the last of the third here at Camden Yards. And we want to send along all of our thoughts and uh, best wishes to our Sunday night baseball director, Mark Payton, one of the best in the business, uh, many time Emmy Award winner. And uh, Cable Ace Award winner. As Charles Johnson falls on back to the screen, Mark is not here tonight. We send along again our best wishes to both Mark and his wife Darla. Uh, Mark's father sadly passed away on Friday, and we wanted to know, wanted him to know that uh, that he is in our thoughts tonight in uh, this time of grief. Charles Johnson, the ninth place hitter for the Orioles, facing Masato Yoshi. One ball and one strike. Johnson hitting 254 he got 13 homers 35 batted in pretty good year for him. Well he's been working with Terry Crowley and and they've been making some changes and you know going along there's the crow as they called him. The King Terry of Crowley. swing. Yeah. The hit man. <laughs> so they have been making some progress. Johnson of course struggled last year when he was traded to the Dodgers. Never did get it going. Being in the low 200s last year. Before he had an excellent year with the Marlins helping them win the World Series. And uh, it's best not to hit it anywhere near that guy. Ordonez. One away. The Tour de France. American Lance Armstrong wears the yellow jersey because he leads the race by seven minutes and 44 seconds after 14 stages. Armstrong, of course, battled back from cancer to regain his place amongst the world's great riders. Tomorrow, turn into ESPN 2 at 8.30 Eastern for the latest news in the tour. For the, uh, the riders, it is a rest day. And then Tuesday, stage 15, also on the deuce at 8.30 Eastern, 5.30 Pacific, the Tour de France. Well, they need a rest, John, after a 106-mile ride today. They need a rest. So I was going to say, just the one day's rest? Yeah. Brady Anderson takes a strike. Brady has scored Baltimore's run. It was really a Brady production. He walked, stole a second, took third on a poor throw by Piazza and scored on a fly ball by Sirhoff. Brady Anderson, we had mentioned at the beginning uh, that there was talk in Baltimore that the Orioles might even entertain offers for Brady Anderson. But Brady, as I understand it, has a, a no trade clause in his contract, so he would have to agree to it. That is deep into center. McCray is going way back there. Makes the catch at the wall. And he seemed to know from the moment that was hit that he would catch it. Well, he knew where he was. I don't know if he knew exactly where the wall was, but he knew he was going to be able to get to the ball. He, now watch this. He gets a pretty good jump on this ball. He started off right away, as you could see. Now watch him. He starts to slow up right here because he knows he's going to get to the ball. He knows I'm going to catch the ball. Now whether the wall gets there first, I'm not sure, but nice play. And he uses his foot to brace himself at the bottom. It's one of the reasons they have padded walls out there now to protect the outfielders. As Bordick comes up, two down, nobody on in the dirt. At Shea Stadium, when a pitcher gets one to hit the ball to that part of the ballpark, he knows McCray's going to catch it easily. The Camden Yards a little different. A little different. The center field is a little bit more intimate than at Shea Stadium. And 
just too high. The deepest part of the ballpark is actually just to the left of straightaway center, 410 feet. Actual straightaway center is only 400 even. And over to the right of straightaway, where Anderson hit that ball, it's shallower still. That one is hit to the deepest part of the ballpark. McCray is way back there, and he's got that one. No, he doesn't have it. He had it for a moment. You know, he's hobbling a lot out there. I noticed it on the ball. He went to right center. He was hobbling. And he's hobbling now as he goes back to his position. But it looked like he got there. And as you said, he looked like he made the catch and went in his glove and then it bounced out. Bardic, as you meant, hit this ball to the deepest part. I mean, he hit it right at the 410 sign. And I guess he didn't catch it, but it just appeared it went away from our view. I thought he had caught the ball, but he actually didn't have it in his glove. Right in the corner at the deepest part. Yeah, clean double for yeah. Bordick. Clean double for Bordick, unlike what the announcer said. I thought he caught it too, because <laughs> it went. It... <laughs> Sirhawk drills one. And caught by Ricky Henderson in left center. One hit, one left to the fourth inning. Matt Franco coming up. Two to one, the Mets lead the Orioles. Sunday night baseball, two to one, the Mets lead the Orioles. Camden Yard is seen from the aerial cam, the gum out aerial cam. And back to action now as Matt Franco takes a called strike from Juan Guzman. Two to one, the Mets are leading. Franco hit an inning ending double play in the first. He tapped it back toward Guzman. This past Guzman, near second. Bordick throws it out. Nice play there by Bart. That was not an easy play, but he made sure he got it on the good hop. He went circled it, half circled, and then charged in and got it. Nice play. Uh, watch Bordick. Now watch, he starts back. Now he sees he's got to come get it. Gets it on the short hop. You want to get the ball on the short hop or the big hop. And stay away from that dreaded in between. Ray Ordonez. Right field. Doesn't seem to matter for Ordonez. No, you're right. If it bounces, he catches it. <laughs> right. Albert Bell with the grab there. Two down. And there are people who say, well, anybody can catch the good hops. You know, the, the best players catch the bad hops and every other hop in between. Two down, nobody on. And Today. That's three pitches for Guzman. He had uh, thrown 72 pitches in the first three innings. So this is, thus far anyway, a blessing for him. Three pitches and two men gone already. Here's Roger Cedeno. Right back to Guzman. A four pitch inning. Now the power coming up big time. Tonight baseball continues now. Last of the fourth inning, Albert Bell leads off for Baltimore, the cleanup hitter. He singled the left his first time. Harold Baines and Will Clark will follow. The Mets infield shifted well around toward the third base side against Albert. The second baseman, Alfonso, you see, is almost behind second. There's she to Albert. Back out of play. John, let's take a quick look. I got some footage from Albert Bell last year in Chicago and this year here. Now look at this Chicago swing. Perfect position. Hips, everything perfect. Here he takes his hands with him. See how they go forward. They don't stay back. And that's one of the problems I think he was having early in the year because he wasn't driving the ball. I mean, here's a guy that averaged 50 plus doubles, averaged about 48 doubles in his last few seasons, and he only has nine so far this year. I mean, he had a high of 52 doubles, but he's not driving the ball, and this is a doubles ballpark plus a home run ballpark. And I think he's starting to, I watched him his first at bat tonight, he's starting to get his hands back much better and keeping them back. Last year he had 49 homers, but also had 48 doubles. That's a ball inside. In fact, back in 1995, the monster year of Cleveland, 50 homers and 52 doubles. Well, see, Johnny, there's two things you have to do. You either have to step away from your hands or you push them back. You push them away. But you have to get them back and get them cocked. Otherwise, you end up swinging with nothing but your upper arms, the upper part of your body. Up the middle, Albert Bell is two for two, two singles.
And his first at bat today, watch his hands, we'll, we'll show you. Now, what, this is what we want right there. That's perfect. That's perfect right there, perfect position. And he gets there again. And this is his first at bat. He gets his hands back, and now he can drive the ball. See right there, now he can, he can drive the ball. But if you take your hands with you, you have no power left. You only swing with your upper body. So that was tonight, so you're seeing some improvement. Yeah. That, Harold Baines takes the ball. And let's take a look at his last at bat. See how they go back? Now, they stay back there before his, they don't go back and start forward before his body goes forward. He steps away from them. Well, he actually pushes his away, but it's the same principle. Harold Baines flying to left his first time. Bell running. And Bell will make it without a throw. He's well, got to drop the ball. That's exactly what we were talking about earlier. He said that you have to watch him because he will take off. I mean, that's... Albert can do a lot of things on the baseball field. I mean, Piazza doesn't have a shot here. I mean, that's just a very good jump from Bell. Piazza trying to rush because he knew he had to rush, and he couldn't get the handle to make the throw. One and one to Baines. Two and one. Now first base is open, but another lefty on deck. Will Clark, another veteran, good hitter. But Baines has the best RBI ratio in Major League Baseball for his at-bats of anybody in the league other than Manny Ramirez. And the center field. Tagging at second bell. The catch by McCray. Robert heading for third. The throw comes all the way through. Good throw by McCray, but too late. Well, that Bain's able to get Bell to third base where he could score the tying run now without the Orioles getting a hit. And so far, the base running of the Orioles have gotten them to one run with Brady Anderson in the first inning, and Bell has put himself in position to score on a fly ball. And the Mets will keep the infield backed up here as Clark comes up, sir. A ground ball to any position on the infield other than back to the pitcher at a third base should easily get a run home. Popped in the air foul off to the left. Clark grounded out to second his first time. That same ground ball here would get it on an RBI. This is a situation when you're the hitter, you say to yourself, I'm going to pull the ball. Whether I get it through the right side or not, I'm going to make sure I pull the ball. I'm just not make sure I don't hit it to the pitcher. And I think that's what you can do as a left-handed hitter against the right-handed pitcher. So I'm going to just make sure I pull the ball. Bell at third, one out. Came in on it. Clark took it. Strike two. You saw the movement on that pitch. And yeah, that was a good fastball from him. And I think Will was looking for something away because he knows that Yoshi doesn't want him to pull the ball as well. But they crossed him up by buzzing one off the plate inside and letting him move back on the inside corner. So Yoshi knew that Clark knew that he knew. See how the catcher set up this time? Way off the plate. Look at that. I mean, you could carry that logic, though, for a long time. Yeah, he knows that he knows that he doesn't want him to pull the ball, but he knows that he's going to try to pull it. Man. <laughs> no wonder you were on that field at Fenway on Tuesday. <laughs> I can trick him with the best of them. <laughs> One and two, the count to Clark. Back inside again. Off the fist is foul. One and two to Will Clark. Ray Miller, second year, manager of the Orioles. Still got the job. Many thought he wouldn't. The team had finished below 500 last year. And this year has just been a, a nightmare since the very beginning. Have a little hot streak going here lately. Now the shortstop Ordonez moves to an in position as Clark takes up an in. Just as that pitch is being thrown, Ordonez, who was backed up, came running into the edge of the grass. Bobby Valentine does that a lot. He will have his out infielder start back, and all of them run in at the same time. But in this situation, he only has Ordonez doing it. Here comes Ordonez. That means if a ground ball is hit his way. The runner third would be out trying to come home. 
because he's been told on a ground ball to the infield you run you score. That's why I say it was important for Will to try to pull the ball. Virginia stays back this time and Clark takes high three and two. Right handed hitter the rookie. The minor is on deck. I mean they ended up walking Will Clark. They get the right handed versus right handed they get the rookie and a double play ball could end the inning and a strikeout guy. So I mean you're in a situation where it may not be the worst thing for the Mets if he does walk Will Clark. Certainly does not have to even think about giving in to him here. Bell third one out three and two to count. And off the outside and that's just the kind of a pitch I think you'd anticipate with all of those things in your she's favor and you have to remember Will Clark is a veteran he you're not going to trick him. I mean, you're not going to trick him by throwing an off speed pit three two or something different. He's looking for the ball with two strikes. You're not going to trick him so you're going to have to make a good pitch and they try to get him to chase one out of the strike zone and he wouldn't do that. Now the middle infield double play depth for the Mets. Ryan Miner who struck out his first time. He is 0 for 4. This is his second major league game. And a little. What? A little ball one. Yeah, ball one. Close pitch. I mean, it started off like it was outside, but it moved back pretty well. Ryan Miner trying to deliver his first major league RBI. First and third, one out. Up after it. Same pitch, only a little higher. That's what you call one of those big swings. Yeah, well, he's got a big swing. That's part of the problem. When you, you know, if you have a big swing like he does, you're going to strike out a lot until you gain, you know, some experience and know which pitches you have to lay off of. And that high fastball is one he better lay off of. A lower fastball to the outside. He slapped it foul. It's one ball and two strikes. Well, so far in the first at bat and this one, they have done nothing but stay away from him. They haven't even come inside to show him any pitches. And they've been basically just setting up on the outside part of the plate and going out there with a fastball or a slider. Out of the University of Oklahoma. Ryan Miner, that's too high, two and two. He was a uh, a basketball player, and his twin brother Damon, also at the University of Oklahoma, played first base for the Oklahoma team that won the College World Series in 1994. Damon now in the the Giants organization. Too low. Well, he's worked the count full now, three and two. So Ray Meadows got a decision, Joe. Although you got a, seems like it's a fairly easy decision. I mean, you got a high strikeout guy at the plate, a rookie, and a, a guy who's not a real fast runner at first base, Will Clark. Yeah, I don't think he was sending. And, and an interesting point here, John, Yoshi had not walked a right-handed hitter in any of his last seven starts. Here's that double move, bluffing toward third, actually throwing the first Clark back though. And the two bases on balls he's issued tonight were to left handed hitter so he still has that record intact. The Orioles have runners at first and third one out trailing two to one in the fourth rookie Ryan Miner in his fourth major league at bat. Clark not running back to the screen fifth major league at bat for Miner he's had four in those previous stories struck out twice including his one at bat tonight. Well, it's a tough call if you're you know Miller I think he's making the right call personally but you know a lot of people say well if it's a ground ball then they're going to say well he should have sent him. But when you said you have a high strikeout guy at the plate you just cannot send the runners and you do not have a lot of speed at first base with Will Clark. Three and two. Hanging in there. The other hand, you know, Yoshi is not a big strikeout guy. Although Tony La Russa, I like the way he put it, Joe. He thinks if you're going to hit and run, you should have two things in your favor a guy who makes contact and a guy with speed if against a strikeout pitcher, or if he's not a strikeout pitcher, that's in your favor, and either a guy with speed or a contact. He said a couple of things should be in your favor if you're going to do it. 
And then Ray Miller does not have those two things in his favor here. Three and two to count. Struck him out. That's a good pitch. I, I mean, he kept fouling pitches off, and he just went upstairs and away, and he strikes him out. I mean, that's a tough pitch, and with a big swing like Miner has, that high fastball is always going to be a problem for him. He laid off a couple, but this one he can't lay off of, and that pitch is up again, and he chases it. Now watch, you can see that he's underneath that pitch. That means that fastball is up above his swing pattern. That means almost identical pitch to the one he struck out on in the second inning. Right. Dave Wallace, the pitching coach, out to talk to Yoshi. Runners at first and third, two down. And Jerry Hairston, who is pretty adept at making contact. While they talk, let's get an update from Bill Pito. All right, John Dodgers and the Pirates, bottom 10, all tied up. Adrian Brown, the batter for Pittsburgh, lofting the fly ball to center, well deep enough to score Kevin Young with the winning run. And L.A. had won six of seven, but they lose here. Pirates win at six, five, and 10. All right, Bill, thank you. Again, we are plugged into the other games going on. There's still two others in Texas, the Giants and the Rangers, and in Anaheim, San Diego. And the Angels going on, so we'll keep you updated on those games. Here it is two to one Mets in the fourth inning. Runners at first and third, one uh, two down. Hairston, ooh, called a ball. You see Piazza did not look very happy on that call. By the way, I, I keep talking about Minor just being up for the minor leagues. He was up, up for the first time this year, this but year, he right. did play a little bit last year. He was the starting third baseman. The historic night against the Yankees in this park when Cal Ripken voluntarily ended his consecutive game streak. Correct. It almost hit Hester. You see, kind of lunges in toward the, the plate on that. I knew you'd straighten it out, so that's why I didn't do it. <laughs> well, thanks for not showing me up. <laughs> Albert Bell at third base. Will Clark at first base. Will root alongside. Hairston flying to shallow center his first time. Miner was six for 14 in the last year. Right at the knees with the sinker. Two and one. Two to one. The Mets ahead. Yoshi trying to find his way out of the corner here in the fourth inning. Bell led off with a single, stole second, took third on a long fly ball by Baines. Clark walked. But then Miner struck out. Now he's battling with the rookie, Jerry Hairston Jr. Hairston hitting 286. The third. Ventura. And that's the inning. So Yoshi gets out of it. And Yoshi does it by getting the two Oriole rookies. Top of the order coming up with the Mets. Ricky Henderson, Edgardo Alfonso, and John Olderud. It is two to one, New York. Guards in Baltimore. This is John Miller along with Joe Morgan, your Sunday night telecasters. The sweeping vistas of this beautiful ballpark, which was the first in this era of new stadium architecture, stadium new buildings, and it has certainly revolutionized the game. Everybody wants one. Everybody wants a Camden Yards kind of a ballpark. Ricky Henderson homered to start the night. 76th time that he has let off a game of the home run. He hit it 413 feet, Joe, is what I estimated it. <laughs> That's pretty good poke. For a 40 year old guy. Yeah. He walked in the second then got thrown out trying to steal. You know last year he stole 66 bases when he was merely 39 and was the oldest player ever to lead the league in stolen bases. I mean that was a, a record he hadn't held. Well he's going to beat this one out I think. Yeah. And over to the box seat railing. Henderson with a hold with a single. Now an update. Here's Bill Pito. All right, John, the division leaders in each league's west, Texas and San Francisco. It's 4-0 Texas here, top of the six. J.T. Snow. The other way, a two-run shot is 12th of the year. Texas trying to stay five games up on Oakland. Giants trying to go three and a half in front of Arizona. 4-2 Texas in the sixth. Thanks, Bill. The National League West leaders and the American League West leaders head to head there and the very first interleague game was played between the Giants and the Rangers two years ago 
Giants with a two and a half game lead over Arizona. Five over San Diego. San Diego is back in there. That's Joe. something. 20 and six in their last 26 games. Come from last place to be back in the race. Arizona blew a seven to one lead in their game today. At Seattle at Safe Co Field. And Arizona have really been struggling. The last month they're now nine and eighteen in their last twenty seven games. And how many of those are games where they had a lead late in the game? This one was in the sixth inning. It didn't happen right at the very end. Texas with a five game lead over Oakland in the American League West. That's right, Oakland. The Oakland Athletics are the second place team. And Oakland won today over Colorado in an interleague game. John, this is a perfect combination to hit and run with. Ricky can try to steal the base, and if Alfonso gets a pitch that he can handle, he can go ahead and try to protect him. But if he doesn't, go ahead and take it. Ricky has tried to steal against Charles Johnson earlier and was thrown out. I've always felt as a base stealer, you have you get on base the next time, you have to go. You have to just make sure you get a better jump. Ricky said to me as Alfonso takes a ball from Juan Guzman, one ball, one strike. He said the first thing he tried to impart to Roger Cedeno was the element of having no fear. Right. In other words, it should never even be in your mind that they might throw you out. And he says, if they do throw you out, that should immediately leave your mind. Right, well you have to say to yourself, oh, I didn't get a good jump, I'll get a better one next time. But at this point, the Orioles think they have stopped the running game for the Mets. You know, because Ricky is not running, and because Charles Johnson threw him out the last time up. Well, if you're going to hit and run, this is the perfect pitch to hit and run on two balls and one strike. One to Alfonso. He doubled the left center his first time. Flight out deep to left center his last time. Ricky not running. And that's ball three. So Daniel, Joe, said that Bobby Valentine gave him the green light to steal whenever from the very beginning this year. And he said that was the first time in his life that anybody ever gave him a green light. It never happened in the Dodger organization. Well, I think that's a good move. I mean, you got a young player, you want him to learn to steal bases. He can't go when you tell him to go. But I think, and I think that's an interesting point you make. I mean, that's a decision Bobby Valentine made that may help that element of having no fear. Right. I mean, if your manager believes in you, right, you have to, you have to tell him you believe in him. Four to Alfonso, so two men around with nobody out. The Mets big hitters are coming up. Next Sunday, we will see the Mets again at Shea in New York. Sammy Sosa, Mark Grace, the Chicago Cubs will be there to take on Mike Piazza and the New York Mets. Eight Eastern, seven Central, five Pacific. We hope you will join us then. The Mets and the Cubs at Shea. Here's Ola Root, up and away for ball one. Sammy got 34 home runs but the Cubs continue to to limp along still last in the National League Central now three games under 500 they get a lot of home games in the second half of the year but they have done all that well at home so far John all of a sudden again he's going back to nothing but breaking balls again he threw three one pitches two one breaking ball all those pitches were breaking balls that he walked out Bonzo on and you can't do that and get to the middle of this order. And now he comes up, he throws two breaking balls to Olerud, and he's down two balls and no strikes. You've got to be able to use your fastball and mix in a fastball with your other stuff. Well, Joe, 86 pitches is not ordinarily a, a real high pitch total. On the other hand, as Ricky Bonus gets loose in the Orioles' bullpen again, 86 pitches on a night where it was 94 degrees and humid at game time. Teague might set in a little bit earlier tonight. Yeah. And maybe that's why he doesn't throw the fastball. He doesn't feel like he's got the pop on it and he's going to the breaking ball. But it's just rolling as well. It's not sharp like it was two innings ago. Two on, nobody out. Here's to the second one. Bordick defers. Not in time. And a nice slide at second base by Alfonso because that was going to be a double play. Olaru doesn't run well. And they were going to be able to turn that, but he put a lot of pressure on Bordick, and that kept him from turning the double play at second base. 
Harrison to Bordick. Now watch, right there, you can see makes Bordick go in the air. That's all you need to do. You do not have to hit the shortstop or the second baseman. You just have to make him get airborne, and that's doing your job. Right there, he makes him get airborne. He doesn't get as much on the throw as he would if he could have planted. And Olerud safe at first. One out, runners at first and third. Here is Piazza. Chance for the Mets to open this up a little bit. Piazza struck out and single to left. Works him inside, but too far in. One ball and no strike. Now, this is the spot where up until a month ago or so, Piazza was just in a terrible slump. I mean, in these RBI chances, he was just not getting any hits. But he has picked up considerably in the last month. His whole game has picked up the last five, six weeks. Through the middle base hit. Henderson scores. Olerud the second. Piazza delivers with the RBI, and it is three to one Mets. Well, if you, smart hitters can see what he's doing, breaking ball after breaking balls when he gets in trouble. And if you're a smart hitter like Piazza, you sit there and you look for the breaking ball and you hit it. That's exactly what happens here. I mean, you know he's going to throw a breaking ball. I mean, you know that. I mean, if he that's all he's done when he's gotten in trouble in this ball game. So he comes with one and he does and he hits it right back through the middle. Robin Ventura with a swinging strike. On the other hand, well, three feet more to the left. That yeah. same ground ball could, would have been an inning ending double play. Yeah, but that's what that's why there are 300 hitters and 250 hitters. They hit the same ground ball, but if you're a 300 hitter, it goes through. So that's the secret. That's the secret. Finding holes. And uh, down to the way, that sinker, Ventura, has singled and walked. Elrod Hendricks, the longtime Orioles bullpen coach, has signaled in from the left field bullpen that Bonus is ready if needed. Ventura is the Mets RBI leader, although he has to discuss his 60. Popped up. A change up and back out of play. One ball and two strikes. Here is Elrod Hendricks, a one-time Orioles catcher under Earl Weaver. He had excellent power, and he's a great baseball ambassador here in Baltimore. I mean, he's everywhere all winter long, spreading the good news of Orioles baseball to the fans in Baltimore and Pennsylvania and Washington, Virginia, the Eastern Shore. Want to talk some ball and Roger Man. Up the middle. He found the hole. Coming around third is Olerud. Heading for third, Piazza. Brady throws to third. Not in time. And on the throw into second base, Ventura goes sliding. It is four to one Mets. As Ventura gets his 67th RBI of the year. Two grounders that found a hole, each good for a run. And that's the tough part. If you, whenever you're in trouble, I mean, you've got to have a ball hit at someone. Kuzma, Guzman not in good fielding position. Ball right back through the middle. And you see Old Root scoring and good hustle by Piazza to get around the third. Ryan McCray in the right center. Brady Anderson tagging Piazza. And he will score easily. Ventura holding in second. Three runs are in. Second RBI of the game for McCray. Even though he does not have a hit. So it is five to one Mets, and that really hurts the Orioles doubly, Joe, that the Mets are getting all these clutch hits in that the Orioles just had first and third one out and didn't get to score anybody. They, they could have scored a run without a hit and didn't score. Well, you have to give Piazza credit. That was good hustle by Piazza to get around the third and be able to score on that fly ball, and Ventura got the job done to get back through the middle, and then McGray drives him in. Here's Franco. Change up too long. Yeah, there, there, I think there was a time, Joe, where Brady had enough of an arm that Piazza wouldn't have tried it, or if he tried it, he would have nailed it. But it was not a real strong throw by Brady. And Ventura took advantage of it as well. He's in scoring position still. Franco takes a fastball to strike. One ball, one strike. Five to one Mets in the fifth inning. 
uh, Sato Yoshi, who had to really labor to get through a dangerous fourth inning, now has got a four run lead with which to work. One and one to Franco. And away for a ball. Two and one. You think Franco is the top, one of the top National League pitch hitters? Would be perfect for the DH job. But tonight he's 0 for 2. He's hit an inning ending double play and bounced out to short. Here's Ventura at second. And the change up is too low. Three and one. Ordonez, a right handed hitter, coming up next. Now, with first base open, you can certainly understand the reluctance of Guzman to throw anything too tempting to Franco. Well, that's true, but you've already struggling, and you're probably one hitter or so away from being out of this ball game. That's logical to say, okay, I'll go ahead and pitch around Franco and get Ordonez. But someone else may get the opportunity to get Ordonez out if you can't get Franco out. But that, is that, I mean, it may be, why, if you're the manager, then why not just have him walk this guy? Well, too? that's, if, if that's the only way you look at it, if you're Guzman, if the manager doesn't tell you to walk him, you better go out and get him. You better try to get him out. Guzman made a great pitch on that last one. It's three and two now. Here it is. Anderson's going back. He's under. And that's the inning. But the Mets get three. Halfway through it, the Mets lead the Orioles five to one. Well, Bobby Valentine's got to make lineups. He's got to make decisions, strategy. Sometimes he just has to cheer. Watch what happened. Well, in fact, listen to what happened. When the Mets were running the bases in the fifth. Look at Big Mike. Look at Big Mike hustle. Look at Robin. Look at that guy. Look at him run. Look at him run the bases. <laughs> <laughs> that works. Got them a run on the sacrifice fly. Sometimes just being a fan is enough if you're a manager. There's Charles Johnson. I mean, and in, in truth, I mean, managers get called upon to make critical decisions, but it's always a decision to maybe have a guy in his, in his best spot to succeed. Johnson drives one deep into right center. Cedeno. And there is one away. Johnson is now 0 for 2. But, I mean, ultimately, it's the players themselves who either fail or succeed. And the manager puts him into that spot, and then he just can cheer him on. Well, that's what, that's all Ray Miller says that he can do. He, I can put the guys out there and hope they do the job. And Ray had some things to say a couple of weeks back when they didn't get the job done. Rather pointed comments about his bullpen. Brady Anderson scored a run, the only Orioles run. Takes a strike from Masato Yoshi. Bonus up in the bullpen for the Orioles. So maybe we've seen the last of Juan Guzman. Oh, and two now to Brady. Brady flied to deep center his last time. Five runs, seven hits, one error for the Mets. One run, three hits for the Orioles. Back to the screen. All oh, and two to count to Brady Anderson. The Orioles had the, the stretch in Toronto not so long ago where they blew saves in three straight games. Twice in one game they blew saves, and then once in the ninth inning when they were ahead, and once in the tenth inning when they were ahead again and lost the ball again. And they had more blown saves than any other team. Brady takes in the dirt for a ball, one and two. To Ray, kind of uh, was overflowing with emotion after the last one there at Toronto. And, his team know his feelings, and then let the, the, the press know his feelings about it. One ball and two strikes to count to Anderson. Too high. Two and two now. And he even got criticism for that, John, because some people were saying, well, you didn't criticize them before, now you're criticizing the bullpen. You know, you, so it's kind of interesting. The numbers are pretty easy to, to criticize. Them. They, they need no criticism. They need no comment. I mean, they're, they're self-explanatory. 
and that was pretty nice hitting by Brady Anderson. Yeah, that's that's what you do not see a lot of today. A lot of guys won't give up two strikes. When they get two strikes, they will not cut down on their swings. They still try to hit the ball hard. What Brady did there, he gave it a two strike swing. All he was trying to do is hit a little low line drive someplace, put it in play, and he did that. So Brady Anderson is aboard, and here's Mike Bordick. Bordick has flied to right and doubled. And Bordick, very important person. If you're Yoshi, you have to think in these terms because you have Sirhoff coming up next, Albert Bell, Harold Baines, Will Clark. I mean, you have the heart of the order coming up after Bordick, so you have to make sure that you concentrate very hard on getting him out. This could be two. Ardonias gets one. And the relay. Plenty of time. Man. <laughs> Alfonso turning that one. With Brady Anderson right on top of him. But they got boarding by 20 feet. Five to one Mets after five. Sunday night baseball. The Mets five. The Orioles one. And the double play ending the Orioles fifth inning. Man, this is this is why Ordonez is such a great shortstop. He makes the play, gets the ball to Alfonso so quickly. Look at that. I mean, even he takes a chance. Look at this. No one's even around him actually when he makes the throw. And look, it's a double play by four steps. Look at, I mean, a lot of shortstop sets themselves first and then throws to second base to make a good throw. But they get the ball. He gets the ball to Alfonso, and it makes it very easy on the second baseman when you have a shortstop to get through the ball that quickly. Well, he is gifted. From, yes. From Cuba, and when he was in Cuba, he was the third shortstop, the third line shortstop on the Cuban team. I still have doubts about that. Maybe at that point he was, but he's so much better now than he was when he left Cuba. I would hesitate to think that there are a lot of three other shortstops better than him in, in Cuba. We or saw anywhere. When we were down there, we saw Herman Mesa. Yeah, they say he was better, John. I agree that he may be, may have been at that point before Ordonez left. I think Ordonez has become a much better player the last few years. Mesa, actually, we saw him. He had served a long suspension. Right. And reportedly, I mean, we didn't ever get a chance to ask Fidel why, but reportedly Mesa got suspended because they suspected him of wanting to try and defect. But uh, he was back, and uh, we had a chance to see him at the Estadio Latino Americano in Havana back in spring training. And all the infielders there, they and the pitchers were the most impressive of the Cuban team players to me. The Orioles, of course, were the team that played the game as Ricky Bonus is on the pitch now in place of Juan Guzman. Bonus just off the disabled list a couple of days ago. Faces Ordonez here, then Cedeno and Ricky Henderson. Five to one, the Mets lead as we start the sixth inning. That was still a highlight of this season for me, Joe. Yeah. And the Orioles, who were in spring training, and you know, it was about a week to go in the spring training, that kind of the you know, the dog days of the spring. Right. And they went down there and they played it as a legitimate game and they played hard. They played with with intensity and it was a great game and they won the game. So it, it was I mean that was a great exhibition. If you want to call it that I mean I, everyone played hard. I mean you knew that the Cuban national team was going to play hard because they're at home. But I really think that uh, you know the Orioles played very well and obviously they came away a, a winner. Harold Baines. Baines. Big That's hit. The that is strike three called, so Ordonez is now 0 for 3. Friday on ESPN at 7.30 Eastern. We want to remind you about an Outside the Lines program from Ruth to Rose to Ryan. 60 years of Cooperstown debates. Then next Sunday on ESPN at 1 o'clock Eastern, the Baseball Hall of Fame induction ceremonies from Cooperstown. This is the year for George Brett, Robin Yount, and Nolan Ryan. They'll all go in together into the Hall of Fame. Curveball from bonus too low to Cedeno. We have not seen uh, Cedeno get on base so far tonight. He's seventh in the National League in batting average coming in. But he went 0 for 2 against Guzman. He's the majors leading base dealer. Could set up a pretty interesting confrontation if he were to get on and see what he could do against Charles Johnson. into the Hall of Fame. All recent players, but they're not the only ones going in. 
Orlando Cepeda going to the ball. And last Sunday in San Francisco, Joe, I mean, we weren't there to see it. We were in Chicago, but they had Orlando Cepeda Day at Candlestick Park. And more than 50,000 people there to salute Cepeda. They said it wasn't on a dry eye in the house. It was just a great ceremony. The Baby Bull going into the Hall of Fame at long last. He's one of my favorite players growing up there in the Bay Area. Ball four, so Cedeno is aboard, and maybe we will see this confrontation now. We got the Majors' leading base dealer, and one of the great throwing catchers behind the plate, Charles Johnson. And we, he's already shown what he can do tonight when he threw out Ricky Henderson back in the second inning. It was just a, a, an incredible throw. Well, we'll see how it changes the pitching pattern to Ricky Henderson as well. They've tried to get Ricky out with breaking balls since he hit the home run in the first inning. We'll see how many breaking balls they throw with Cedeno on first base. That's where a base stealer will help the hitter. Cedeno, everything will be hard. 50 steals, been caught 12. Ball one to Ricky. Charles Johnson doesn't subscribe to that theory anyway. He starts him up with a slider. Now that's confidence. Yeah. But everything, you won't see a slow curve or a changeup, I don't think, in this situation. You may see a fastball and a slider. Those will be the pitches he'll try to use. It's lead five to one. Time to you. Ricky Henderson tonight is homered, walked, and had an infield single. He scored two runs. I mean, it just continues more of the same for Ricky in the month of July. He came into the game tonight having hit over 370 in July. In fact, he's been hitting, hitting 370 since they got hot after the eight-game losing streak in July. He's been hitting 422 before tonight. Two for two tonight. And with Ricky, whatever his batting average is, usually you add an extra 150 points to his on-base average because he always gets his walks. I've always said an on-base percentage is more is more important than a batting average. Right. The only thing I don't like, I was watching Sedano there, and he's leaning, you know, bluffing, starting. And when you do that, if you don't time the pitcher perfectly, you can't go. And he couldn't go on that pitch. I think you have to get out there, read him, and then take off. But if you start, try to time it and take off before he moves, then I think you have a problem. See there, how can he go? He can't go. Base hit. Ricky Henderson is three for three with a walk in this game. I mean, when Ricky's getting on base that often, his team is just going to score some runs. There's no question. Well, again, you know you're going to get something hard. Here's a fastball. And again, it's pretty much in the middle of the plate, and Ricky does something with it as Bordick tries to dive and stop it, but he can't. Now you have to be alive for the double steal if you're the Orioles because you got Sedano at second and Ricky Henderson at first. Two speedy base dealers. Alfonso the hitter. He is doubled, flied out, and walked. Strike on the outside. It's already leading five to one. Now Alfonso is hitting 303. And remember, even though he's hitting in the number two spot of the order, he has 58 RBIs. He's on track to uh, drive in close to 100 runs this year. Pickoff play at second. So Daniel is back. And the throw taken by Hairston. And those are the things you have to do when you have a base dealer second. Let him know that you're not going to just let him take his lead and walk away. You have to make him think about someone in second base, whether it's the shortstop or the second baseman. You have to try to take turns to keep him close to the bag or to keep him from timing the pitch. Base hit. Charged by Sirhoff. Sedano got great speed. Scores easily. Good throw by Sirhoff, but Sedano just is too fast. Six to one minutes. Henderson stopped at second. 59th RBI of the year for Alfonso. It was amazing. I remember years ago when Dallas Green was the manager of Mets, and he talked about Edgardo Alfonso. He says, told me, he says, I got a special player here. And, I mean, he looks like a special player, and he just continues to get better. And here's Serhoff. He did bobble it, but as you mentioned, Sedano with his speed was going to score easily.
John Olerud has walked, struck out, and hit into a force play. Takes a called strike into his 0 1. Olerud, in over 300, almost since he became a man. It was kind of a reclamation project for them. And over the head of Borden. Now Ricky Henderson around third. Scores easily. Stopping at second, Alfonso. Three straight hits for the Mets. I mean, other than Ricky Anderson's leadoff homer in this game, the Mets have been doing it with an amazing amount of clutch hits. And singles at that. And Ricky was going to be doubled off on this play if, the, if, if Bordick would have caught it. See where Ricky is? If he catches it, Ricky's out. There's no way Ricky could get back, but he was. That's the smart thing to do. If you're out there, you might as well go because they're going to double you off anyway. But this way, if the ball gets through as it does, you can score. And here comes Bruce Keeson now to the mound. Ricky Henderson having one of those big nights. And he's had a lot of them here lately. Yes, you're right. I mean, Ricky is a special player. I mean, he's always been a special player. A lot of talent. And he's gotten older. He's become, you know, more experienced, just taking advantage of the things that he has learned over his career. You know, this is only his 62nd game played of the year, and he now scored 46 runs, 27 steals, and tonight he's been on base four times. He scored three times in St. Petersburg the other night against the Devil Rays. He got three hits and two walks and scored three runs in that game. But one of the things they wanted, you know, in the offseason was to get a leadoff man, and that's why they wanted Ricky Henderson so badly. Doug Johns, the left hander up in the Baltimore bullpen as Keeson concludes his visit at the mound with that outside edge 0 and 1. The answer struck out twice as single and was driven in a run. You know that bonus has gotten ahead of each one of these hitters and has not been able to put any of them away. He'd get ahead and then they get a base hit. The answer hitting 322 for the year. Ooh. That one maybe came back and got a little more of the play than bonus he wanted but he got it by him. Well the good thing is that the fastball was up a little bit and if you're going to throw Piazza fastball you want it to be up and you also want it to be in and that one was up and in a little bit. Not where you would would ideally throw it but it was at least it wasn't in the middle of the plate or away from it. Jammed it. And that pop up will come back out of play. Oh and to the count. Nice pitch there. Now the first Five hitters in the Mets order have all been Ricky Henderson like in this game. It's not just Ricky. The first five hitters, Henderson, Alfonso, Olerud, Piazza, and Ventura, have had 18 plate appearances and have reached base 14 times. Those first five have scored a total of six runs for the Mets. So Daniel, the ninth place hitter, scored the other one after walking to start this rally here in the sixth. Alfonso in second, Olerud at first. One and two now, two Piazza. The Mets tonight in their advance with runners in scoring position, five hits in ten advance. And that's the way they've been scoring it, one at a time. Well, that'll get the job done. Yeah, because they have not been hitting a lot of home runs, but they have been able to take advantage of they have the 300 hitters, they have the speed, and they have the guys that have been picking them up in the clutch. That makes Bobby happy. I think that's Bobby's happy face. I said I think. <laughs> <laughs> One and two, the cat. Yeah, at least he didn't paint on a mustache and wear some glasses. <laughs> two and two, the cat. Well, since the firing of half of his coaching staff, his Mets starting on a Sunday night telecast from Yankee Stadium that we worked. They have gone 25 and 12. And that's interesting. I, you know, I, you, you, sometimes being a former player, I don't know really what to make of it. You know, maybe it did shake up the organization. I, I'm not sure. Or players. Or maybe they were due. Coincident. Yeah, they were just due. Strike three, Piazza. Strikes out for the second time. And that's the only balls that I've ever seen bother Piazza. Balls on the inner half of the plate with a good fastball. You better not go in there with half stepping. This is a good fastball, but actually not that one. Down and in, he usually handles pretty well also. 
but you want the ball off the plate if you can and in. And he swings the bat well. I mean, he handles the ball down and in pretty well normally. Well, the Mets are leading seven to one, but Ray Miller with the left handed batting Ventura coming up is going to go for the lefty. Ten wins acquired in the trade for Randy Johnson. Garcia is 10 and five with a 4.86 ERA. From Camden Yards in Baltimore, big crowd on hand, but in this interleague game right now, the National League team, the Mets, with a big lead over the Orioles, who have been outstanding representing the American League this interleague games. Ten and five against their National League counterparts. But right now it's all Mets as Doug Johns, a left-hander, comes on to face Robin Ventura. As we look now at the gum out in-game box score for the New York Mets and keep your eyes pointed toward those first five hitters in the batting order. Ricky Henderson, Alfonso, Olerud, Piazza, and Ventura. Look at that. Ricky three for three a walk. Alfonso two for three a walk. Olerud one for three a walk. Piazza two for four. Ventura two for two with a walk. Those five, in fact, the first four hitters actually have scored six. And uh, Ventura himself has been on three times. McCray hitting behind Ventura has driven home two runs. Don't even have a hit. <laughs> Sometimes if there are so many runners on there you can hardly help driving in some runs. Ventura takes a call strike. Alfonso in second. Olerud at first. Ventura has singled walk and singled home a run. Alfonso. Getting his lead from second as you saw. And that is too low. One ball and one strike. Next Sunday we'll see the Mets again at Shea Stadium as they take on the Chicago Cubs. Benny Akbayani, maybe he'll get back in the lineup. He's kept his average over 300. He hasn't hit for as much power lately, but he's still getting base hits. Look at that. Now that is finding a home. Yeah. Alfonso, the throw! away from Johnson backed up by Johns it is eight to one Mets. Well you're right I mean you have to give them credit the Mets are finding some holes. Let's take a look at that from match camp Joe. Watch the watch all the infielders and how they go after it. That's just to let me put this ball in play type of swing only 56 mile an hour swing there. But here comes a throw and he actually would have had him had he could have had he been able to control the ball but he wasn't actually the ball hit his foot as he's sliding in that's why he couldn't control it. Ryan McCray. Robin Ventura. In the fifth inning grounded one through the middle base hit this time a ground ball. Just not hit well at all but just where nobody could get to it. But the great thing John we've seen Mike Piazza swing 90 miles an hour and that was 50 plus miles an hour by Ventura just putting the ball in play and he finds a hole on the right on the left side. And Ventura went back to the uh, the dead ball era. That was the uh, Napoleon Lajoie <laughs> kind of a swing. Just hit him where they ain't. Wee Willie Keeler. I was going to say, I thought that was Wee Willie hit him where they Well, they both were the same kind well, of. You just mixed them up there. Wee Willie. Mixing and matching here. Wee Willie was an Oriole. The Orioles, uh, back in the 1890s, Joe, when the National League had 12 teams, right. the Orioles were a National League team, and they were the best team. And the, the old time guys who go back and research stuff insist that was one of the greatest teams of all time. They won three straight titles. Okay. The Orioles of the 1890s. John McGraw was a player on that team. Wilbert Robinson. And a lot of names that were big names for years to come in baseball. All the Orioles ball club, and they developed a lot of things in the 1890s. The hit and run. So that's why he talking history with you in this game. The Baltimore Chop. You know all that stuff. The Baltimore Chop. Now I've heard of that. Yeah. The 1890 Orioles yeah. started that. They played the Giants here in a game, and started this hit and run, and the the Giants had no idea what had hit him. <laughs> Why do those guys keep running when we're pitching the ball? <laughs> John McGraw eventually managed the Giants, one of the great managers right. of all time. Wilbert Robinson, Uncle Robbie managed the, the Dodgers for a long time. Two and two the count to McCray. Two on, two out, three in. And 
that ends the inning. A strikeout to Doug Johns. But three in the fifth, three more in the sixth. The Mets are well in control. The big guys coming up with the Orioles now. V.J. Serhoff, Albert Bell, and Harold Baines. But it is Angel Fly and is lined out to left center facing Yoshi. And is called the strike. It's 0-1. Eight runs, 11 hits, one error for the Mets. One run, four hits, no errors for the Orioles. Serhoff, Bell, and Baines coming up. Sellout crowd at Camden Yards, 47,480. Down the left field line, Ventura hurrying out. Man, not quite. Tough play, and he almost made it. The gum out in game box score for the Orioles. Brady Anderson has scored their only run a walk, a steal, took third. On a throwing error by Piazza and Surhoff brought him home, but not much else to report. Harold, uh, or rather, uh, Alfred Bell, two hits, but both singles. Harold Baines, the leading hitter for the Orioles, 0 for 2. And uh, their great opportunity came in the fourth inning when they had first and third one out, trailing only 2 to 1, and they could not score. Yoshi got through it. To the count. This has been an interesting at bat, John. The very first pitch Yoshi threw him, he just like stood out there and threw a batting practice pitch to get a strike because I guess he knew Serhoff was taking. Then he threw him a real good fastball. He fouled off. Now he comes way up inside. That was definitely a waste pitch, 0 and 2. Outside, Surhoff lunges out to fight it off. One ball and two strikes. Now, Surhoff has had such a year. He's had 128 hits already. This is the Orioles' 91st game. I mean, if he stayed at that pace the rest of the year, he would get 231 hits. The Orioles' all time club record was set by Cal Ripken in 1983 when he had 211 hits. And that's a ball down and away. Two and two to count. We don't know if he's going to keep that pace all year long, but it's it's a real hot pace. By the way, there's Callen not playing. He's got a, a few days' growth of beard, Joe. He said <laughs> he told me before the game he's just elected not to shave until he starts playing again. Well, okay. Well, it's interesting, John. I really believe that the rest helps Cal Ripken. I mean, I really believe that. Here you see him before the ball game, trying to make find out how soon he's going to be able to get back in the lineup. You see him flexing his hand there and trying to get the circulation in there. But that's what he was doing in warm-ups today before the ball game. But I really believe that this helps him. And there's another hit for Serhoff to add to his collection. So Daniel hustles over to cut it off. Bell coming up. Here's Bill Pito with an update. All right, John. San Diego begins tonight just four games out of first place in the National League West, Padres in Anaheim. Tonight, Gary DeSarcina here for the Angels drives in Orlando Palmero. And the Angels within one now at 4-3 in the bottom of the seventh. All right, Bill. We'll keep you tapped uh, on that one. The Giants, the first place team in the National League West, playing the Rangers, the first place team in the American League West. 5-3 Texas ahead there in the eighth inning at the ballpark in Arlington. Albert Bell, two for two, both singles. He's also stolen a base. And that's ball one, too low to Albert. Well, Albert has been a, a definite lightning rod for criticism here in Baltimore lately. Uh, a fan in Philadelphia claimed that Albert had made an obscene gesture toward them. Wrote a letter to uh, the Orioles, and uh, the, the, the fan was invited to watch a game here at Camden Yards from up in the owner's box. And Ray Ordonez takes it. Albert Bell retired. And then there was a story in the Baltimore Sun today that was saying that the Orioles were actually looking into trading Albert Bell, if there's any interest. Also, maybe even seeing if there was a way to I don't know, claim a breach of contract or whatever. This yeah. was all according to the, the Baltimore Sun. The, the Orioles have not verified any of that. Yeah, they have not made that statement, but it was interesting because 
the Players Association said that's, that would be like looking for a needle in a wheat field, not in a haystack, but a wheat field, trying to board a player's contract on that basis. Here's Harold Baines, and that's too low. One ball and no strikes. But there's no doubt, as you mentioned, he is a lightning rod for some criticism. And well, and, and that with the fact the Orioles have been losing, and Albert is not having that big year. The, uh, sometimes a lot of sins get forgiven, and everything else is going well. That is a double play. Olerud tagged the bag at first, then they had to make the tag at second, and Ordonez did in time to get Sirhoff for the lead the Orioles as we go to the seventh inning. They've turned a couple of nice double plays tonight. Hey, John, these guys are good. I mean, this is a tough double player. Now, watch what Olerud does. He goes to the bag. Now he has to throw away from the runner. You see Ord Ordonez was standing out away, so he got a good throw and gave him a good target. Nice play. Benny Akbayani. Right-handed hitter. And he is the pinch hitter here for Matt Franco, the DH. Doug John's the pitcher for Baltimore. One ball and one strike. We're watching the Mets who have been coming so strong the last several weeks. Changed up on them. One ball and two strikes. The the Yankees. New York's other team today had another one of those historic days at Yankee Stadium. It was Yogi Berra Day. Right. Yogi who was behind the plate when Don Larson pitched his perfect game in the 1956 World Series. So what happens? They have Yogi Berra Day, sort of the the, the return of Yogi to the big ballpark in the Bronx. He and George Steinbrenner had been estranged for many years. And so what happens? Yogi returns. They have great ceremonies before the game. Big crowd. And David Cohn pitches a perfect game. This change up right cut and Akbayani is gone. One away here in the seventh. Number 10. And as you mentioned, John, a good change up by Johns. And Akbayani chases it way off the plate. In in the 38 year history of the Mets, the Mets have never had a pitcher throw a no hitter. See how I've tied this David Cohen thing in? The yes, Yankees. I got Yogi you. Berra into the Mets. Right. Very deftly. I got you. Pretty impressed. You know, I follow you very well. But 13 men who at one time were with the Mets have combined to throw 20 no-hitters while pitching for teams other than the Mets. Well, none of them ever pitched one for the Mets. And of course, David Cohen started his career as a Met. Was 20 and two. That was, that was 20 and three. I think in 1988. Well, you're the historian. I hope you're not asking me. No, no. <laughs> that was a statement. Okay, good. <laughs> Mike Bordick got a tough hop in the last. Stayed with it and got his man. Ordonez retired. Nolan Ryan had seven of those right hitters. Oh, okay. By the way. That's Jeff Rebel at shortstop, not Bordick. John, another footnote on that. Well, here, here's Rebel coming in. You see that tough hop. That's that in between hop we were talking about earlier. Remember, as an infielder, you want to catch it on the short hop or the big hop, not that in between hop. Rebel played it nicely. John, one other footnote there today, as you mentioned, Don Larson was there today. He threw out the first ball, you know, on Yogi Berra Day. And when David Cohn pitched that no hitter, Yogi Berra said it's deja vu all over again. That was his <laughs> comment after the game. Two and all the count to Cedeno. Yogi really said that. Yes. Oh, he's like quoting his own line. That's Yogi. That's Yogi. It'll be in the papers tomorrow. But that's Yogi. Cedeno, 0 for 2 with a walk and a run scored, takes a strike. Two and one. Two down. Nobody on. Nolan Ryan had seven no hitters after he left the Mets. And Tom Seaver pitched one after yeah, he left he, the Mets. He pitched it with the Reds. Did you make any great plays to save the no hitter for him? How'd you guess? <laughs> <laughs> Not quite for Houston. How did you guess? Meanwhile, after that hit by Cedeno, here's a highlight from Bill Pito. 
All right, John, you and Joe talking about the perfect game by David Cohn today on Yogi Berra Day with Don Larson in attendance. Orlando Cabrera, the batter, two outs in the ninth. Scott Brocious comes down, makes the catch. Cohn striking out 10, a perfect game, and the Yanks win at 6-0. He's the third Yankee in history to toss a perfect contest. Man, what, what a great scene. From, from that picture, you can see how much they care about David Cohn. Yeah. I mean, his, his teammates. I mean, if you were to take a poll in that clubhouse, which pitcher, by all rights, should be the one to throw a perfect game? David Cohn wins it. He's become sort of the, the elder statesman on that, that club, as, as well as sort of the, the spiritual leader You're right. of the staff. John, back to that play you asked. Oh, oh, oh yeah, go yeah. ahead. Ask me again. Seaver pitched a no-hitter for the Mets, and I was wondering if he for the Reds, had, if, for the for the after Reds. he left the yeah. Mets, wondering if anybody happened to make a great play behind him to save the no-hitter. Right. Yes. There no, was a, there was oh, a. Oh wait a minute. Did you play in that game? Yes. Yes. Oh yes. yes. There was a tough ball hit in the hole by Keith Hernandez. I had to go over and make that nice pickup, lunging, turning, and throwing. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. I just thought you should know that. Lucky thing you were there. Yeah. Lucky thing. Could have gone through. <laughs> Take one of those little in-between hops, dude. <laughs> it was tough, I tell you. <laughs> Tom Seaver, now a broadcaster for the Mets. Right. Uh, he's, some, he's like a some kind of a pitching instructor, like a spring training or I don't know what the, the exact job is, but his main job is is a uh, commentator on Mets telecasts. Henderson, the hitter, he's been on base four times tonight. He's hit a home run. I mean, this has been a Ricky Henderson night. Ricky taking on the Orioles here. And he has been playing like this for the last few weeks. I mean, he's raised his average up above 300. As you mentioned, he had three hits in the ball game a couple of days ago. He's three for three. Two and two. Cedeno at first. Now with a score, eight to one. Cedeno given no indication of trying to steal, although Will Clark continues to play in the bag with him. There have been so many runs scored in baseball. This year, in the last uh, know, handful of years, some teams feel like eight to one better get more. And that's a good point because what is the cutoff line now for a guy to still lives? What it used to be was when Sparky was the manager. Well, when Sparky was the manager, he wanted you to, if you didn't have enough runs where a grand slam could tie you, then you needed some more runs. So that if you led by point. five, you yeah. didn't steal. Yeah, but if you need if five or more, then the pitcher should be able to hold it. So that was kind of his philosophy. But a lot of, you know, managers now, you have to think, you know, maybe it's seven runs or so now. Three and two the count with Cedeno running. That was a nice pitch off Henderson's fists. And Hairston throws out Ricky the first time they've retired Ricky in this one. Eight to one. Orioles game here in downtown Baltimore. The city is energized. Yeah. And most of the parking is actually off the, the premises, so people park in the, the many public garages nearby. And the streets are just covered with people. It's as if the, the state fair is in town 81 times a year. And the local restaurants and taverns bring chairs and tables out on the sidewalks and music. And it's just a real party, festive atmosphere. Become a a great attraction here in downtown Baltimore. Something similar happened in Cleveland. That whole downtown right. is completely different from the way we, we remember it. Denver in uh, what they call Lodo with the Coors Field. And actually Cincinnati's had that type of atmosphere for a long time. You know, with the, well, being right, the team with the stadium being right there in downtown Cincinnati. In St. Louis, the yeah. Coors Stadium. Well, maybe that's probably, I that's, guess that's the new trend. And it's a good trend. As we take a look at Camden Yards and the surrounding area here in downtown Baltimore from the gum out aerial cam. Will Clark, base hit to right field. First hit for Will. Hit number six for the Orioles. We were talking about Ray Miller as we look at Bobby Valentine earlier. And Ray has been under a lot of pressure here in Baltimore. I mean, Big things that were expected when he became manager last year, and again this year. High payroll, big stars, and uh, a couple of times this year, uh, it's kind of come spilling out of Ray after particularly tough losses. As Ryan Miner stands in, he fouls one back to the screen, and it is 0-1. By the way, a new left fielder is on, Melvin Mora for the Mets. 
Back on April 24th, look at this. We walked 14 people today. We pitched like a bunch of 12-year-olds. If you want any more stories, go out in the clubhouse. They're the ones making all the money. That's actually a pretty good quote, John. <laughs> That's pretty good. Well, it certainly fueled the talk shows for a while. <laughs> they looked like you put a lot of thought behind it, too. I mean, that was pretty good. I think that was a... They had, had a, a game with Oakland. They had come storming back from a, like a 6-2 to two deficit with an 8-run 7th inning to go ahead 10-6, to six, and then they gave up, I don't know, two runs in the 8th and three in the ninth and lost anyway. I mean, that will take it out of you. Yeah, that, that's tough. Or as in Ray's case that day, bring it out of you. <laughs> Again, he had some uh, other tough comments after games in Toronto not too long ago. Mike Timlin doing some uh, stretching out there in the Orioles bullpen. Minor. Shallow right, Cedeno. And that is out number one. After he made these comments about his own Orioles bullpen the other day about he didn't know how they could look their teammates in the eye after their performance. We talked to him about that here this weekend. And here's what Ray told us. In all of last year, I was criticized uh, heavily by the local media, uh, mainly because I wouldn't point fingers at anyone. We had 11, 12 free agents. Um, guys were, some guys were having bad years, and obviously I wouldn't say, well, it's his fault that we're losing or that he's not having a good year, and I'll never do that. Uh, Conversely, this year, uh, you know, we've blown 20 saves, and uh, you, you mentioned the fact that, you know, we've got to do better in the bullpen. Our bullpen's not doing the job, and then you get beaten up because you're saying you're picking on the bullpen. That one is hit deep and foul by Jerry Hairston Jr. Back. John, Way back. Out of play. That sounds like one of those situations where you can't win. <laughs> you don't say anything. They criticize you, as he said. If you do say something, they say you're picking on someone. So. Sometimes a manager's job is the most difficult job on the field. And really, I think a, a, an actual truism, Joe, is this. If the team doesn't win, whatever happens, you're going to get blamed for it. Right. Base hit just past Alfonso. So Jerry Hairston gets his first hit of the game. Over to second, Will Clark. So that's seven hits now for the Orioles against Masato Yoshi. And Charles Johnson comes up. Well, it takes a lot to get one through this infield. These Mets infielders are really good players. They're very quick, great footwork. The key to being a good infielder, especially a middle infielder, is your footwork. And Alfonso and Ordonez. Both of them have great footwork. Two on, one out. Charles Johnson is grounded a short flight deep to right center. Base hit. Clark held up just to make sure it went through. And when you're down by seven, you really always need to err on the side of caution. So the bases are loaded with one out on the top of the order. Brady Addison coming up. Bobby Valentine talking to a pitching coach, Dave Wallace. Well, it could be that Yoshi is running out of gas. I mean, he's pitched well. And I think that's going to be all for him. Mets bullpen going with the left-hander, Rigo Beltran. And the call has been made. Bases loaded, one out. Brady Anderson coming up. Stay with us. All through this year. Now they're a little bit shorthanded because John Franco, their closer, is on the disabled list. But nonetheless, the bullpen has continued to pitch well. So here's Beltron. Brady Anderson has walked, stolen a base, and scored a run, flying deep to center, and single. One for two. High and tight. Trying to of the breaking ball they missed badly with it almost hit Brady and Brady gets hit a lot I mean, he's not afraid of getting hit taking one for the team he's been hit 13 times Yoshi gone and those are his runners Will Clark Jerry Hairston and Charles Johnson they all belong to Yoshi's record Mets double play depth in the infield they've turned a couple of beauties 
already in this game. That one misses. 2 and 0. Earlier today, Arizona had a 7 to 1 lead in their ball game and could not hold it against Seattle. Came back with a fastball and Brady popped it up foul and out of play into the upper deck. Two and one. Yoshi, six and a third innings pitched. So far, one run, eight hits, two walks. And they'll take that line anytime from Yoshi. But we'll see how many of these inherited runners are allowed to score by Beltran. Brady Anderson would like to see all of them score. Two and one the count. Three and one. Well, he's definitely digging himself a hole here. Looked like he was trying to stay away from throwing the fastball, but now it's three and one. You got to give him a fastball. Turk Wendell, the right-hander. Dennis Cook, the left-hander, heating up in the bullpen. Strike two. Down around the knees. It's a full count. Even a grand slam. I mean, in a way, the Orioles might be better off with anything but a grand slam. Keep the pressure on. You're right. A grand slam clears the bases and makes it eight to five. I don't think they would throw it back, though. And they take it if they yeah. get it. Yeah. But keeping those men all over the bases, keeping the heat on. Yeah, that's. I agree. Back and out of play. Three and two to Brady Anderson in the seventh inning. The Orioles. Have averaged more than five and a half runs per game. I mean, they've been one of the the premier offensive ball clubs in all of baseball. A very productive lineup. Very slow. Piazza two. Scoring on the play. Will Clark. Well, I think they had a communication problem there. Piazza should have stayed behind the plate. And Beltran would have had a play at home plate. He would have had a force out. But Piazza came from behind the plate quickly to try to make the play. Beltran should have pointed back to him so he could have stayed behind the plate. Now watch how far this ball is right out there in no man's land. But they get Will Clark. Now watch if he stays there, they would have been able to get Will Clark at home plate. See, Will just now getting there. But they did not communicate very well and Brady Anderson beat it out. So now a run is in and the bases are still loaded. And the right handed batting Revele is coming up. Another lefty behind him, B.J. Surhoff. The runners, Kirsten was over at third, Johnson at second. There's Anderson who at 35 years of age able to beat that play. He still runs well. Brady, another guy like Ricky Anderson, keeps himself in superb condition on a year-round basis. You'd be amazed how fast some guys can run when they can smell a base hit, John. And he thought he had a chance and he beat it out. I remember a scout telling me one time, Joe, because they, they timed the runners right. from home to first. And how the same runner would be so much faster yeah. when he had a chance <laughs> for a hit versus a routine ground down. Correct. Here's Jeff Revelay up for the first time in the game. And he backdoors him with a slider. It's 0 1. And John, we're all guilty of that. <laughs> well, it's almost like that cliche in baseball giving 110%. Right. Give giving a little, little something extra. extra, yeah. And that'll get a run home. It's right into the Mets' dugout. One base. Hairston scores. Johnson to third, Anderson to second in the wild pinch. So Beltran inherited three runners from Yoshi, and two of them have now scored. And for the season, six of the nine that he has inherited have been allowed to score. Not a lot that Piazza could do. He tried to catch it, but the ball bounced so far in front of home plate, not much he could do with that. So it is eight to three, and a base hit could make it eight to five. Johnson at third, Anderson at second. Anderson runs well. Into the upper deck off to the right. One ball and two strikes to Revele. Now, after Revele, the Orioles really get serious. B.J. Surhoff, Albert Bell, Harold Baines, Will Clark. Revele, though, has not hit much utility in field. He has only three RBIs in 111 at bats. You get an RBI here with a ground up. Infield is back. 
two and two. Shows three runs allowed. And that one gets away, but Johnson will hold it third. Well, Beltran is throwing that 60 foot curveball. It bounces about six feet out in front of the plate. Beltran has only pitched 30 innings for the Mets this year and leads the staff with six wild pitches. And now we know why. Trying to make a game of it, trailing eight to three. Runners at second and third, one out in the seventh. for the big league we're willing to exchange a run for an out there that's the way it turned out it is eight to four and now B.J. Serhoff to try and turn this into a serious rally well if this was a close ball game they would have taken Brady Anderson going to third base but I think it was a smart play by Brady trying to distract Ardonias but Ardonias made the wise play just take the out at first that's the rule of thumb if you're ahead in a game don't do anything real risky right just make the routine play. The routine play was to first base. That's the way Ordonez went with it. And Serhoff is having a great year against all types of pitchers, lefties and righties. In fact, he's been a little bit better against the lefties. Look at that. Tonight, one for two with a sacrifice fly. Runner at third, two down. Don't try and give a little crossfire action there. Missing with it, two and oh. Yeah, I think it's easier to hit left-handed pitching now if you're a left-handed hitter than it was before. Very few pitchers throw a true curveball now. The curveball was a, was a pitch that bothered a lot of left-handed hitters. Now they throw sliders and fastballs, and that's not going to really bother you that much. So I think it, it's easier now because very few left-handed pitchers really throw a true curveball. You see the final from the ballpark in Arlington, the first place Rangers. Have defeated the first place Giants five to four. John Wetland who's been struggling held on for the save in that one. And that slider misses three and oh. Well, Beltron inherited three runners from Masato Yoshi and has allowed all three of them to score. Yoshi's line doesn't look so good anymore. Four runs allowed and six and a third. Strike to Serhoff, three and one. Brady Anderson belongs to Beltron. That's an interesting stat for relief pitchers. How well they do with their inherited runners. Albert Bell would be next. That is through. And now it's a four run rally. And the Orioles are one base runner away from having the tying run of the game come to the plate. Dave Wallace heads to the mound. They've got the right-hander, Turk Wendell, ready in the bullpen. He's apparently baseball presented by Gum out. Eight to five. The Mets lead the Orioles. Last of the seventh inning. Serhoff at first base. And Albert Bell coming up against tough right-hander, Turk Wendell. And Albert comes up in a spot now. The Orioles don't necessarily need a big fly, although they'll this take is the it. seventh inning. It's not the eighth or ninth inning. Yeah, they'll take it. A big fly would make this a one run game. One ball and no strikes. And the Mets get to the, the late innings. They got Wendell, the right hander, Cook, the left hander. And then with the injury to John Franco, Armando Benitez is now the closer. One ball, no strikes.
Melvin Mora picks that one up. Remember, he replaced Ricky Henderson with a huge lead to start this inning. But now, Harold Baines, who is the Orioles' leading hitter, with a chance to tie the game. Well, he won't get a chance to do it against Wendell, it doesn't look like. I don't know. This is a breaking ball, a little slider. Doesn't do a lot. But Albert Bell is swinging the bat very well right now, and you get the ball up, you make mistakes, and he's making you pay for it. It'll be Dennis Cook, the left-handed pitcher, to face the left-handed batting. We're at Camden Yards in Baltimore. It looked like a blowout not so long ago. The Mets came into the last of the seventh inning with an eight to one lead. Now here we are four pitchers later. It's been Yoshi, Beltran, Wendell, and now Dennis Cook. And so far, nobody's been able to get that elusive third out. And now Harold Baines, who at the age of 40, at the tail end of what has been a very distinguished career, is now having his best year. And Baines tonight, 0 for 3, but he is the possible tying run. Yoshi, whose numbers are wrapped up for the night. The question now is whether he'll get the win that he worked so hard for. And it didn't seem that that would be in question. Two men on. You saw Sir Hope at second. There's Bell at first. Bobby Valentine's Mets. Anything but secure at the moment. So here is Baines, the Maryland native. It is 0-1. He has faced Cook before. Two hits and seven career at-bats against him. And Baines is hitting 314 this year against left-handed pitching, but he did not often face a lefty. Well, that was a good start for Dennis Cook. Fastball right under the hands. And Baines was looking for a fastball, but that ball ran in on him a little bit. What that really does is it opens up the outside part of the plate by getting that first pitch in on him. You can go away if you want. Well, they're going to stay inside. That is foul. And now Cook is ahead of him on two. And that and that's just good pitching and good location there by Cook. Now Piazza is going to go out and talk to him and decide what they want to do. If they want to waste another one inside or if they want to just try to go away with a breaking ball or go away with a pitch. And this is I like this because you don't want to have any bad you know communication problems here with the game on the line. And they were probably talking about more than this, just this next pitch. They're talking about two pitches down the road here. If we go inside with a fastball and miss, or if we go away and miss, what are we going to do next? Because this is an 0 2 pitch. This is the pitch they can use to set Baines up for the out pitch, or they can go after him. Sir Hoff ready to run from second, Bell from first with two down. 0 and 2 to Harold Baines, hitting 352 for the year. Wastes one outside, one ball and two strikes. See, that pitch was just to let Baines see something away. Now they've got to decide whether they want to go away with a breaking ball. I don't think they're going to go back inside with a fastball. Because the only way he can really hurt you if you make a mistake and get the fastball out over the plate. Yes, they are. Inside with another fastball. Well, Baines went up after with two strikes. Well, that was supposed to be, truthfully, another waste pitch. He was supposed to go up and in, and hopefully, you know, Baines would swing at it as he did and miss it. But that's not the pitch that they wanted to get him out with. One and two to Baines. When he homered here last night, he became the all-time home run leader among all designated hitters. Had uh, bad knee problems the last several years, limiting him to being a DH. That's high down the left field line, foul, and in amongst the spectators. Well, they're, they've decided that they're going to pitch him in, and they're preferably up and in, but that one was just in. And Baines is late on all the fastballs they've thrown inside. But you got to have excellent control like Cook has on these first three, four pitches because if you throw a fastball and you get it out over the plate, he's going to hurt you. Now, he's been giving him all the hard stuff, Joe, but right. he does have a very good curveball. I know. I'm, I'm surprised that after the fastball, one and two, he just barely got a piece of up and in. He didn't miss away with a curveball to try to get him to chase one out there. A ball and two strikes. Two now on, two out. Now they'll do that. And Baines 
was able to fight that one off. And a tough pitch. One and two to Baines. He's a native of Maryland. He had such a distinguished career with the White Sox, they retired his number in Chicago. And you can see Harold Baines bailing on that pitch because he thrown so many fastballs inside he was trying to open up a little bit to get to the one inside and that pitch was away. I think it would have been better served if that would have been a breaking ball but that's just sidearm fastball punched foul in the air down the left field line. Well I would tell you I, I don't under, I don't understand it. you've got to try one breaking ball down and away. Give him a chance to help you out. He may chase it. The beautiful view of this beautiful ballpark in Baltimore, Camden Yards. You have to remember he's not used to facing a lot of left-handed pitchers, so he's not used to seeing a lot of curveballs coming going away from him. He's used to seeing that breaking ball coming towards him. Well, he has seen seven pitches in this at bat, all fastballs. Sir Huff and Bell still out there. The Orioles have four runs home in the inning. Eight to five Mets. Fastball again. To the inside and popped him up. Ordonez. And the inning is over. That's why I'm not a pitching coach. Yeah, I was sure if they just stayed fastball, Joe, they'd <laughs> get it. The Orioles themselves sort of answered the question we were posing with a four run rally. Now, don't forget. Been a great year for Baines, but not this time against Dennis Cook. Well, this is great pitching, great location. See, that first pitch set up this hole at bat. And you see, none of those pitches are actually on the plate. They're off the plate inside. And that's why he kept doing it. See, none of these are strikes. And that's why he was successful. After he got a hit in the count, really, he didn't throw another strike. But I think it's tough for Baines because he's not used to facing a lot of left-handers. And you just do not pick the ball up quite as quickly as you'd like. Edgardo Alfonso against Doug Johns and Hairston throws him out. Well, we saw those first five pitches, but that, that battle was still going. See, none of these pitches are strikes. Look at this. Everything is off the plate, and he finally goes off the plate even more, and Baines swings at it. That's just good pitching by Dennis Cook because he was able to locate the ball exactly where he wanted, and good pitch calling by Piazza. John on the route. That's a foul. On the route. He is one for three with a walk. A run batted in, a run scored. The Mets eight, the Orioles five. Joe and I were talking the other day about with all the runs scored today in baseball, that the idea of shutting down your running game. Right. It's, I mean, when you should do it, it's kind of changed. And I, I think the Mets, when they were at eight to one, shut it down. Yeah. But now, I mean, it's eight to five. You know, you can't just stop it and then pick it back up. You know, a lot of people say that. I mean, I, I don't know what the number should be anymore. I mean, should I mean, should you ever stop your running game? I mean, if Cook had made one mistake there to Baines, this game would be tied right now. Yeah. So I, I don't know what the number is because there are so many runs being scored and there's so many home runs being hit that you can get back in the ball game quickly. Personally, Joe, this is from a fan's perspective, right? You know, because I never had to worry about, you know, stealing a base ahead eight to one, right? And then, like, I was going to get drilled because of it, or somebody <laughs> else was. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, that's a different perspective, I guess. But I want them always to play the game. Yeah. No matter what the score, let's play the game. On a room with a lazy pop, that will go back into the crowd. Well, well, it's interesting, John, that. You know, people do not expect, you know, Mark McGuire or Sammy Sosa to stop trying to hit home runs when it's 10 to nothing. But they do expect the base dealers like Ricky Henderson and the other players to stop stealing bases when it's 10 to nothing. So it's kind of an interesting thought there. I mean, if that's what you do, you should steal bases, but it's hard to get away with that. Hairston? Yeah, I mean, if you do, there's a pitcher out there yeah. who said, uh-uh. Yeah. And somebody pays a price for it. Roger Cedeno got that infield hit in the top of the seven with two down. And it was just obvious that he was not running. Right. The Orioles knew it. We knew it. And he is the leading base dealer in the majors. But now it's eight to five. Who knew? 
Here's Mike Piazza. He's two for four with a run batted in. Time taken. He's also scored a run. The Mets have put eight runs on the board. The only home run they've hit. A leadoff homer by Ricky Henderson in the first inning. Doug John's done a very fine job. He's the third Oriole pitcher out of the bullpen. For two innings in relief of bonus. The Orioles bullpen, as you saw, is very busy right now. Deep into right center. On its way. That one caught on the warning track. Albert Bell. So Piazza. Not quite deep. As the Orioles battered around in that inning, scored four runs to make it eight to five. Now, if they've got an, even one more run in that right. rally, Joe, you'd say right in the game. But now three runs, they have to, another big rally to get. Yeah. Hit hard, but caught by Cedeno. You know what's going to be interesting is this lead stays at three runs where they bring Armando Benitez in to try to save it. He has been, you know, their closer since John Franco went down. But he has not had a lot of success, you know, in this ballpark. At least last year he was he struggled some on occasion here in this ballpark. And they booed him here quite often last year. But he has resurrected his career in New York and looks like the guy's gonna be a closer for a long period of time. Here's Jeff Conine. Pinch hitting for rookie Ryan Miner. And it's ball one. Conine is hitting 294. Seven home runs, 36 batted in. Eight to five. The Mets lead the Orioles. Ryan Miner out of the game now. He went 0 for 3, couple of strikeouts. Well, Miner's probably thinking there's a left handed pitcher out there now. I sure would like to hack at him. How they take yeah. me out, yeah. <laughs> Well, Conine often will DH against left-handed starters in place of Harold Baines. You mentioned that Harold doesn't often face the lefties, and that's why. Conine also played a lot of first base when Will Clark was on the disabled list against all types of pitching, and Conine got a, a hot hand going while Clark was out. He's a veteran and one-time All-Star Game MVP. In the game was it? I think the year that we had the ballpark in Arlington, All-Star game. You got it. One out, nobody on. The Orioles had a great opportunity in the fourth. It kind of haunts them now. They had a chance to score at least one run. First and third, one out didn't score, and then the Mets turned a couple of great double plays in the fifth and sixth innings. Well, that's part of the key to their success. The Mets, I mean, they played great defense, especially inner defense, the infield defense. Two and one the count. Drilled the center field. Way back is McCray. Gone. Home run, Conai. Now it's a two run game. of the year for Jeff Conine. This looked like a fastball out over the plate and exactly what it was. Fastball right out over the plate up a little bit and he drilled it to straightaway center field. More of a line drive home run. Oh man. Said well I had to throw a strike. Well, a three run lead. In effect you can you can risk that. Second pinch hit homer this year for Conine, and his eighth home run overall as Hairston takes a strike. Hairston also singled and scored a run in that four inning, or that four run seven inning rally. Eight to six now. The Mets ahead. You mentioned Armando Benitez, Joe, whether or not he will come in here in his old ballpark against the Orioles in his first visit back. If Franco were healthy and still in there, Benitez probably would have been the man pitching to Conine there. Right. This is Benitez time of the game or had been. So this is where they, they kind of miss Benitez. There he is out in the bullpen. Yeah I think he's saying yeah I'm ready. I'm ready. Give me the ball. Put me in coach. Yeah, give me I'm the ready ball. to play. <laughs> Armando who came in with the Orioles. A young guy from a foreign country. And 
and he struggled at times and was a learning process but also his last two years in Baltimore especially in, in impressive with numbers it's a strikeout for Hairston he's upset with himself he he helped cook out on that one two down well these are the Mets at their best I mean they're in the field defense that play was made by Ordonez. This is a fine play made at first base by Olerud. He takes the out. Now he makes a good throw. Quick tag by Ordonez. And I tell you what, these guys can play. This infield is, these guys on this infield can play. And I mean, we haven't even seen Ventura tonight. And he's won a gold glove in the American League a couple of times. So, very good infield defense. Will be showed by the Mets. Charles Johnson, change up outside. Ball one, Johnson, one for three. Now the, the, those four infielders have combined for 17 errors the whole year and I know a lot of shortstops that have a lot more than that right now. Yeah. One ball one strike to Johnson. I mean that's that's amazing. The Mets have given up fewer unearned runs than any team in baseball. And there's always important. I mean, they've, they've allowed 11 unearned runs, Joe. I mean, the, the, the teams they play against have allowed 25 unearned runs. Just as a comparison. And the Orioles, for several years, have been, year in and year out, the top defensive team in the American League. But I don't know that they ever had a team that was quite this good in the infield. Well, definitely not as athletic as these guys are with the range that they have. You have to remember when you, uh, Alfonso has a lot of range, Ventura has a lot of range, Ordonez, all these guys have great range as well as, you know, being able to fill their positions well once they get to the ball. And it's two and two now to Charles Johnson. Well, sometimes, you know, you talk about Ray Ordonez and the, the lack of offense that usually he has uh, had and yet that great defensive prowess. If you really want to know the value of Ordonez, ask one of the Mets pitchers. Right. I remember a statement that Whitey Herzog made about Ozzie Smith once. He said he may not get four hits a game, but he takes four hits away from the other guys. And that's enough for me. Two and two. Ooh. Three and two. Anderson on deck. Cook, we're not too happy about that last call. Well, you know, and I understand that. I, I'm trying. I was surprised that Charles Johnson could take it. He said, "Woo, <laughs> whoa, boy." <laughs> yeah, I, I, Charles took it with two strikes, but I guess he knew it was low. Three and two to count now. Brady Anderson would be next. Two down in the inning. Eight to six Mets. John Olerud. Heading to the ninth inning, leading eight to six, and this was a guy that will forever be etched in the memory of Mets fans who saw it in 1986. Orozco got the final out of the World Series against the Red Sox, threw his glove toward the, the sky. It was never to be seen again, <laughs> not by Jesse anyway. The celebration began, and Orozco began his career as a Mets. So many, many, many years ago, still out there. But Joe, this year, for the first time. There have been times where it looked like maybe he's nearing the end. As Conine stays in to play third base for only the second time this year. Jesse Orozco, he is now. Today, here is Mike Piazza. This was on his base hit back through the middle. You can see he hits the ball out in front. That's 90 miles an hour, but we actually had one earlier, 93 miles an hour, but it was a fly ball. And here's Robin Ventura. Let me show you the difference. I mean, look where he hits the ball, 56 miles an hour. Here's the plate right here. He actually hits the ball behind the plate, and that's why he dribbled it through the left side, but he put it in play. So anywhere from 90 to 56 miles an hour, you can get a base hit. Anywhere in between. It was uh, the prime example of if you put the ball in play, something good might happen. Right. And a lot of good things are happening for the Mets there in the fifth and sixth innings. I mean, they scored six runs in those two innings. Uh, two innings. Five of them were driven in with singles. Yeah. And I'm sure if you ask the Orioles about it, 
all of them were little dribblers that just made it past somebody into the uh, into the outfield. Carrasco to Ventura, ball one. And some of them did have glasses on as they went through that infield. I mean, they were just avoiding gloves and avoiding everything. There was some of them that weren't hit that hard, but that's, I mean, hey, that's the sign of a good team. They put the ball in play. This is like a new term you've come up with. Oh, yeah. <laughs> put, they put the glasses on. <laughs> Bespectacled the ground balls. 2-0 the count. Roscoe this year with a 7.58 earned run average. And Joe, I think that the drill troubling thing in, in 19 innings, he has walked 17. I mean, just your Orozco for his old career, guy comes and throws strikes. <laughs> and caught by Hairston as we looked at it. Live from Mascan there. So that is the first time that Ventura has been retired in this game. He's had a couple of RBI hits. Three hits total, plus a walk. Camden Yards, a lot of folks have uh, headed home. Perhaps uh, catching here in Baltimore the, the rest of the game as they drive with uh, Jim Hunter and Fred Mantra, the outstanding Orioles play-by-play -play broadcasters. Maybe they're home now listening to us, Joe. <laughs> Brian McCray, that's a strike. John, you were talking about this. There's Benitez up in the bullpen. He's coming in. He's coming in. He's back in Baltimore. You were talking about Orozco being with the Mets and helping him win a championship. And what are you getting your book out for? I was going to ask you a question. How did the Mets get Orozco in the first place? I don't know. Oh. Gotcha. That was too easy. <laughs> That was too easy. I thought you might know. Uh, I think he came from the Twins. They traded Jerry Kuzman to get him from the Twins. See, I figured you'd come up with it. I was just kidding that I didn't know. Yeah, I figured that. Of course, Kuzman, Mets fans didn't think it was a very good trade there for a while, because, I mean, Kuzman right. pitched well. Yeah. No, I agree. Well, he pitched well every time I was in the batter's box. I know that. I mean, Kuzman went to Minnesota and won 20 games. Yeah. What were they thinking? Of course, as, if I recall, Kuzma's no longer pitching. No. <laughs> Popped up. Rebele. McClay is retired. Ryan now 0 for 3 with a couple of RBIs, though. This copyrighted telecast is presented by authority. The commissioner of baseball it may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form, and the accounts and descriptions of this game may not be disseminated without express written consent. Jesse Orozco, this has been, been a, a miserable year for Kamenek. He's been hurt on the disabled list. While he was on the disabled list, on rehab assignment, he pitched a game against the Cuban national team. After, I don't know, an inning or so, that game got interrupted by rain, and he still can continue to pitch and got hammered. And he'd been getting hammered quite often since uh, he was he's back from the rehab assignment 20 and two third innings pitch he's given up 22 runs 17 walks two or two the count to Akbayani struck out in the seventh when he came in as a pinch hitter from Matt Franco he's still the designated hitter the Orioles are now the top of their order up in the last of the inning against their old teammate Brady Anderson Jeff Rebele B.J. Surhoff I say their old teammate Dennis Cook is in the game right now but Armando Benitez, the flame-throwing right-hander, now the closer with the absence of John Franco, is up and ready in the bullpen. And let's hope he doesn't try to throw too hard. Brady Anderson, Jeff Rebele, B.J. Surhoff. I suppose uh, Bobby Valentine might keep Cook in to face Brady. We're ahead of ourselves. Top fly, shallow right. Kirsten. We go to the last of the ninth inning. We'll see what Bobby Valentine has in mind. Anderson, Rebele, and Surhoff coming up. The Orioles are down by two. As it comes back to Camden Yards for the first time since that three-way trade with the Mets. And he is now the Mets closer. Benitez is always a sort of a star-crossed figure with the Orioles. So much expected and not always delivered. But now Benitez has seemed, seemingly found himself with the Mets. Benitez 
47 in the third innings pitch, 79 strikeouts, and only 22 hits allowed. I mean, just unbelievable numbers. But there's a lot of pressure going on with this appearance. A little more pressure than the other ones. Knowing that this is, you know, the team that traded you, knowing that they felt like you didn't live up to your, their expectations, and you're going to try to show them. So the one thing that he has to guard against is he doesn't try to overthrow the baseball here in this situation. And Benitez was always a, an emotional sort right. when with the Orioles. Sometimes his emotions would get the best of him. He is introduced now. Benitez, of course, last year had that infamous game at Shea Stadium where he hit Tino Martinez with the pitch after giving up the home run to Bernie Williams after first coming into the game and precipitated a brawl two years ago in the postseason. I don't know if Orioles fans have forgiven him yet. Give up a couple of critical home runs to the Cleveland Indians in the league championship series, including the only run of that extra inning game where Cleveland won the series in a one nothing game. Tony Fernandez homered against him. So now he faces his old mates for the first time. Brady Anderson will lead it off. Then Jeff Revelay, B.J. Sirhoff, Albert Bell do up fourth in the inning. One ball, no strikes. 96 miles an hour on the fastball. Brady has been on base three times tonight and has scored two runs and driven home a third. A fine night for Brady. Well, now when you see him throwing a hard but way high like that, Joe, does yeah. that tell you anything? Yeah, well, it just kind of tells you maybe he's overthrowing. That was 97. That was harder than the first one. And, you know, that, that's the thing he had to guard against coming in, overthrowing the baseball in this situation. So perhaps a little extra adrenaline yeah. pumping. 2 and 0. A strength. Now, he had his first blown save since taking over for John Franco right after the All-Star breakdown in, uh, in Florida. He ended up getting the win in that game. Well, John, you're not a closer until you've had a blown save. <laughs> you can't be officially classifiers and see how you bounce back from that. Three and one. The Orioles need a base runner down by two runs. And uh, Brady Anderson is one of their most proficient at becoming a base runner. in the postseason in the second game with the Orioles poised to go ahead two games to none against Cleveland. He gave up a crushing home run in the eighth inning to Marquise Grissom. And Cleveland got out of Baltimore in a 1-1 tie instead of being down two games to none. And then in the final game, he hung a split-fingered pitch to Tony Fernandez just over the high wall and right. And that was the only run of that game. And uh, Benitez, seeing as how the season ended right there, fans were, were none too pleased all that winter. And now he's back in Baltimore with his new club, but he's in trouble. Jeff Revel at the hit of Brady Anderson not being held in the bag, runs and steals easily without a throw. And a lot of people say, well, why did he do that? Well, he did it to stay out of the double play. And I think that's smart to do. Because if he stays at first and Revel hits a ground ball, these guys have proven that they can turn the double play. And you're out of time. Now you have three legitimate shots at trying to get the tying run home. You have three times you're going to be able to hit with the tying run at the plate. Eight to six minutes. We never heard a report as to why Bordick left the game. The only thing we could figure, Bordick left the game because it was eight to one. Uh, we never got a report saying he was hurt. And Rebelay came into the game in the seventh innings, had one at bat, drove in a run with an infield out. If you're Benitez, all you're thinking about now is the hitter. Forget about Brady Anderson at second. You're thinking about the hitter and to make sure you do not make any mistakes like hanging a slider or something of that nature. And that's back out of play. 
DJ Surhoff on deck, an all-star, having a great year, and a left-handed hitter. One of the league's leading hitters. And an Albert Bell behind him. And Bell, you may recall, 1996, when the Orioles were the wild card team, Bell hit a dramatic home run in Cleveland in the playoffs against Benitez. A grand slam to break a 4-4 tie at the Jake. 0-2 oh, to Reveille. Now that was supposed to be some kind of an off-speed pitch. That was that split finger, I believe, but he didn't he just release it high. Now here's a guy hitting 188. He might be doing a favor with anything but the hard stuff. That's my analysis, Joe. And I agree with the, your analysis, John. Brady Anderson at second base. Nobody out. And you were right. Go with. Well, I mean, just he just blew it right by him. And now Sirhoff. Well, this fastball's up as well, and you cannot handle a 97 mile an hour fastball up there. He's also a little tardy on it too. And the Orioles have no left-handed hitters in their bench. A little short-handed the bench with Ripken not available anyway. But all of their available left-handed hitters were in the starting lineup. So Reveille had to bat for himself there. Now Sirhoff. Now you're into the power. Albert Bell on deck. Sirhoff is the possible tying run. Coming in for it. McCray. Two down, and that leaves it to Albert Bell. He got Sirhoff out on one pitch. Albert has not been hitting with a lot of power. He's been getting a lot of base hits. He has three base hits in tonight's ball game. And from what I've seen, he's just not quite loading up to drive the ball as he was before. But he seems to be starting to get into a groove. We have seen him on Sunday Night Baseball against some real hard throwers like Troy Percival in Anaheim. In spots like this, ninth inning, tight ball games launch home runs on those 98 mile an hour heaters and he's done it as we mentioned earlier against Benitez in a big spot in Cleveland in the 96 division series Brady Anderson at second Albert is the possible tying run two down nice pitch beautiful slider on the outside corner and you see he's saying to himself just calm down and make the pitches that was a good scene right there Right on the outside corner. Albert has had three hits tonight, all singles. Now he two for 14 against Benitez. That's in the regular season. It doesn't in include that grand slam he hit against Armando. Man, that that pitch just exploded up there. 99 miles an hour. And I think Albert kind of. Smiles himself at the speed of that pitch. 99 miles out, but you know what? He was almost there. If that ball's five inches lower, Bell could have gotten the bat there. Two down and two strikes, and the Oriole fans here rise to their feet, trying to inspire Albert Bell. Brady Anderson at second. Harold Baines would be next. And there you see Piazza. Good job there, trying to get him to throw that fastball up. See if he could get Bell to chase it. He did not. The Orioles were down eight to one going into the last of the seventh inning. It is eight to six now, but they have only one strike of life left to them. Right center, Roger Cedeno. And the Mets have won it. Armando Benitez returns to Baltimore and gets the save for the Mets, who were challenged at the end. But the Mets hang on to win it. They gain a ground in Atlanta. Only four back now in the National League East at the end of the weekend. Mets eight, Orioles six. Yoshi gets the win. Guzman the loss. And the former Oriole, Benitez, saves it. Gets Bell out in front just enough. And he knows he's done his job. And 
and that gets a slight monkey off his back. He says, now, I've done it here in Baltimore. I can do it the rest of the way. So, Carla Overbeck, the U.S. Women's World Cup Championship team started tonight, but for the Orioles, too much the same old story. The Mets, their role continues, 26 and 12 now. John Miller for Joe Morgan. Stay tuned for Sports Center. Good night from Baltimore. The Mets look to continue the streak on Monday night, welcoming the Pittsburgh Pirates to Shea for the first game of a three-game set. New York took an early lead in the home half of the first inning when Robin Ventura stepped to the plate with the bases loaded. Line drive off the glove of Young and into right field. In comes Alfonso. Around third is Olerud. He scores. All the way to third goes Piazza. Two to nothing, New York. Benny Agbayani was the next batter for New York. Line drive, base hit to right field. Piazza scores. Ventura hits for third. The throw is cut off by Morris. Three to nothing, New York. Pittsburgh's Brant Brown, who may have saved two runs with an inning-ending catch in the first, then put two runs on the board for the visitors when he stepped up against Mets starter Rick Reed in the second. That's well hit deep to right center. Cedeno back towards the wall. Gone! A two-run homer for Brant Brown. And suddenly the Met lead has gone from three to nothing to three to two. An RBI single by Roger Cedeno in the home half of the third inning bumped the Mets' lead to 4-2. An inning later, they broke the game wide open. Robin Ventura came to the plate for the second time in the game with the bases loaded and drew a walk from Pirates reliever Scott Sauerbeck. Benny Agbayani followed with what would be the biggest hit of the ball game. Line drive right field, Brown after it, base hit. Two runs have scored. Ventura goes to third, 7-2 New York. The Mets survived a sixth-inning two-run home run by Pirates first baseman Kevin Young and a wild streak by Mets closer Armando Benitez, who threw 13 straight balls in the ninth inning. Turk Wendell came on to help Benitez and the Mets out of the jam, and New York recorded their sixth consecutive victory. Final score, the Mets 7, the Pirates 5. Tuesday night was turn ahead the clock night at Shea Stadium as the Mets or Mercury Mets took on the planet Pittsburgh Pirates in a game played as if it were the year 2021. The uniforms were something out of a science fiction movie and the Diamond Vision Board had some pretty interesting visions of what the future will bring. But on the field, baseball was baseball, and in the first inning, Pittsburgh's Al Martin opened the scoring with an old-fashioned home run off Mets starter Oral Hershiser. And a high fly ball, pretty well hit to left field. Back goes Ricky to the warning track. It may go, and it's gone for a home run. A leadoff home run by Al Martin. Pittsburgh increased their lead to 2-0 with a run in the fourth before Al Martin would again go deep, this time in the seventh. And Martin smacks one in the air to deep right center field. Looking up at Cedeno, and it's out of here. Al Martin with his second home run of the game. A bolt over the 396 mark in right center field. Martin's 16th home run of the year. And now the Pirates have a 3-0 lead. Meanwhile, Pirates rookie pitcher Chris Benson was holding the Mets at bay. New York finally got on the board in the seventh inning when Robin Ventura stepped in with no one on. One to Ventura. Blasted in the air to deep right field. Going back is Brown. Back on the track. Looking up at the wall. It's out of here. Robin Ventura parks his 19th home run up in the low section in right field. And the Mets finally break through against Chris Benson. The Pirates' lead is now 4 to 1. That would be all that the Mets would muster as their six game winning streak goes by the boards. Final score, Pirates 5, Mets 1. Wednesday afternoon, the Mets and the Pirates square off in the rubber game of the series with newly acquired Kenny Rogers making his New York Mets debut. Rogers' new teammates supplied him with an early lead when Edgardo Alfonso stepped up with no one on in the home half of the first inning. My ball hit pretty deep to left field. Back goes Garcia to the wall, looking up, and it's out of here! 
Edgardo Alfonso with his 15th home run of the year up into the bleachers in left center field. And the Mets jump out to a 1-0 lead. Later in the inning, it was Robin Ventura's turn. And the payoff pitch. Fly ball, deep right field. Adrian Brown to the wall. That's a gunner. Number 20 for Robin Ventura. The Mets are leading by a score of two to nothing. Meanwhile, Rodgers was in the midst of an outstanding first inning. Rodgers allowed just one unearned run and gave up only one hit. Unfortunately, he would not figure in the decision despite leaving with a two to one lead. Pittsburgh's John Wayner made sure of that when he stepped up with the bases empty in the eighth. Fly ball, well hit left field. Agbayani to the wall, it's gone! Dennis Cook gives up a pinch hit homer to John Wayner, and the Pirates have tied it at two. But the Mets bounce right back in the home half of the inning. Vinny Agbayani got the big hit. And the pitch by the left hander. Line drive deep toward the gap in right center field. Racing back is Giles. He won't get it. It's one hop over the wall. A ground rule double for Benny Agbayani. Alfonso comes in to score the lead run. And the Mets have gone in front three to two in the bottom of the eighth inning. New York piled it on from there in route to the victory. Final score, Mets nine, Pirates two. Octavio Dotel has made quite a splash in this his rookie season. The Dominican-born right-hander is the talk of the town, and he's loving every minute. I love to pitch, man. I love that, and I love that position, and I don't care about who's going to be gonna be in front of me, hitting my what, I, what I'm going to throw, so I don't care. I just go there and have fun. When I go to the mound, I just want to do my thing and what I have to do during the game. When everybody starts on game, the game.